हाँ जी सत करतार वाहू जी का खालसा वाहू जी की फतेह वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू एवरी वन वेन दिन इज सन इज सेटिंग इट्स शॉर्ट ऑफ एन आफ्टरनून लेट आफ्टरनून हेड इन डेली लिटल स्मॉग ही आउट साइड एंड आई एम वेरी चेलस टू सी द सन आउट इन लंडन आई थिंक द लंडनर्स हैव स्टोल द सन टुडे एंड आई एम इन कन्वर्सेशन विद डॉक्टर स्टेफानिया पासामोंदे हु एंड वी हैव हैड टू डू दिस आई मीन शी इज अ फेमिनिस्ट आई एम अ मेल शॉविनिस्ट एंड वी हैव डिसाइडेड टू स्प्लिट द स्क्रीन 50-50 सो दैट आई डोंट गेट गेट सॉर्ट ऑफ थ्रोन आउट ऑफ द मेल शॉविनिस्ट शॉविनिस्ट्स क्लब फॉर सीडिंग मोर स्पेस टू द फेमिनिस्ट बट Uh, welcome, Stefania, to the 156th uh, Yara Nath Virtual Barracks Series Mela. It's such a pleasure. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, <laughs> and thank you so much, Bai, for inviting me. It's a real honor. No, it's, it's my pleasure, really. Um, so, friends, uh, Stefania is an Italian, uh, but don't don't be afraid. I won't be speaking in Italian much. Uh, non parlo in italiano con lei, per <laughs> well. Perché non parlo tanto, <laughs> non parlo tanto. <laughs> because I don't speak well. <laughs> much. <laughs> but but uh, she is based in London. I mean, of all the people, she ended up marrying an American. So <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> the reason why she's there. And a um, um, couple of words about her, just to introduce her. Uh, Stefania is an international concert pianist and radio presenter. of future classic uh, women awards on the awards winner wrs now i intend to propose to her that if you can just stretch women to wo man it will become english punjabi is that guy that man so maybe i get to go there too <laughs> but <laughs> but we'll see i'll try to negotiate with her today uh twice gold medal at the academy award and silver medal at the global music award she's regularly invited at the prestigious brits awards and grammy grammys awards as best soloist and best album of the classic fields uh, her recordings are broadcast by the major classical radio stations worldwide including bbc radio 3 and classic fm in uk the grand fm in canada while many solo recitals and concertos with orchestra have been broadcast uh, television uh, including rai 3 and sky tv in italy tvg in spain or uh, 1 plus 1 tv in ukraine among others uh, stefania is recipient of the 2020 artist vision award a once in a lifetime award bestowed by the academia uh, in recognition of her exceptional talent she's not blushing uh, originality <laughs> and vision in the field of music a, a visionary artist destined uh, or destined to shape the course of classical music and broaden the musical landscape in the years to come that's a beautiful beautiful note by them um uh, dosto and i'll now introduce a little in punjabi so you get to hear some punjabi and see how close it is to italian some words you will find uh, <laughs> which are which are exactly the same or little close um dosto te mere jani dushman ho as i say uh, so you know the pun uh, i say my friends and my dear enemies dear foes <laughs> the, the, the demons the demons and the devil uh, incarnates all alike i i evoke all of them <laughs> so dosto mere jani dushman ho darinde ho prinde ho pyar wale ho aashq ho mohabbat karne wale ho जी आया नू अज की एक सौ छपंजव एक सौ छपंजवी बैठक है यार नाथ वर्चुअल बैठक सीरीज की दिस सीरीज एज यू ऑल नो इज डेडिकेटेड टू द फाइव हंड्रेड एंड फिफ्टी एथ बर्थ एनीवर्सरी ऑफ गुरु नानक महाराज को याद करते हैं अस ये मना रहे हैं महीने के अखीर में तो सारे पता है साढ़े पांच सौ साल मुकम्मल होएगा पांच सौ इकंजव पांच सौ इकंजवा इकवंजवा साल शुरू होएगा तो भावें पच्ची साल की जो कहते हैं साढ़े को समा हों अगली तिथि जी हूँ पांच सौ पचहत्तर मनावे फिर छे सौ मनावे छे सौ वेले पता नहीं मैं होव ना होव मोस्ट प्रॉब्लम नहीं होवगा पेल ही मर मुकया हो जो कहते हैं दाने पिसते पे ने दाने मुक् भी जाते होंगे ने पर खोरे मेरे व्डे दादा भाई एक सौ दो साल पूरे करके गए ने पर यह तो पक्का है कि जिस हाल अज हाँ 
ਪੰਜਾਹ ਸਾਲਾ 550 ਮਨਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਹਾਂ ਇਸ ਹਾਲ ਵਿੱਚ ਤਾਂ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੋਵਾਂਗਾ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਤਾਂ ਤੈ ਹੈ ਅੱਜ ਦੀ ਮੇਰੀ ਮੁਲਾਕਾਤ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੈ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਸਟੈਫਾਨੀਆ ਬਾਸਮੋਂਟੇ ਨਾਲ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਅੰਤਰਰਾਸ਼ਟਰੀ ਕਨਸਰਟ ਪਿਆਨਿਸਟ ਹਨਗੇ ਰੇਡੀਓ ਪ੍ਰੈਜ਼ੈਂਟਰ ਹਨਗੇ ਫਿਊਚਰ ਕਲਾਸਿਕ ਵਿਮਨ ਅਵਾਰਡਸ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕਿ ਅਵਾਰਡ ਵਿਨਰ ਡਬਲਯੂ ਆਰ ਐਸ ਹੈਗਾ ਦੋ ਦੋ ਮਰਤਬਾ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਸੋਨੇ ਦਾ ਤਮਗਾ ਮਿਲਿਆ ਅਕਾਦਮੀ ਅਵਾਰਡ ਤੇ ਸਿਲਵਰ ਮੈਡਲ ਮਿਲਿਆ ਗਲੋਬਲ 뮤직 ਅਵਾਰਡਸ ਵਿੱਚ ਤੇ ਇਹ ਅਕਸਰ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਬੁਲਾਇਆ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਹੈਗਾ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਬ੍ਰਿਟਸ ਅਵਾਰਡਸ ਤੇ ਗ੍ਰਾਮੀਜ਼ ਦੇ ਅਵਾਰਡਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਐਜ਼ ਅ ਬੈਸਟ ਸੋਲੋ ਇਸ ਦਾ ਬੈਸਟ ਐਲਬਮ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਕਲਾਸਿਕਲ ਕਲਾਸਿਕ ਫੀਲਡਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਨਿਉਤੇ ਆਉਂਦੇ ਰਹਿੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਹਰ ਸਾਲ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਨੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਰਿਕਾਰਡਿੰਗਸ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਵੱਡੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਕਲਾਸਿਕਲ ਸੰਗੀਤ ਸ਼ਾਸਤਰੀ ਸੰਗੀਤ ਜਾਂ ਕਲਾਸਿਕ ਸੰਗੀਤ ਕਹਿ ਲਓ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਸ਼ਾਸਤਰੀ ਤਾਂ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨੀ ਹੋ ਗਿਆ ਦੱਖਣੀ ਏਸ਼ੀਆਈ ਸੰਗੀਤ ਹੋ ਗਿਆ ਪਰ ਕਲਾਸਿਕੀ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਮੌਸੀਕੇ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਤਾਲੁਕ ਰੱਖਦੇ ਰੇਡੀਓ ਸਟੇਸ਼ਨ ਨੇ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਚ ਬੀਬੀਸੀ ਰੇਡੀਓ ਤਿੰਨ ਹੈਗਾ ਕਲਾਸਿਕ ਐਫਐਮ ਹੈਗਾ ਯੂਕੇ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਗ੍ਰੈਂਡ ਐਫਐਮ ਹੈਗਾ ਕੈਨੇਡਾ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਤੇ ਕਈ ਸੋਲੋ ਕਨਸਰਟਸ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਰਿਸਾਈਟਲ ਦੇ ਕਨਸਰਟਸ ਆਰਕੈਸਟਰਾ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਵੀ ਬ੍ਰੌਡਕਾਸਟ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਟੀਵੀ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਵੀ ਖਾਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਰੇਡੀਓ ਰਾਈਟ ਰੇ ਰਾਈਟ ਰੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਮਾਫ ਕਰਨਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਇਟਲੀ ਦਾ ਹੈ ਸਕਾਈ ਟੀਵੀ ਦੋਨੋਂ ਇਟਲੀ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹਨਗੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਟੀਵੀ ਜੀ ਸਪੇਨ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੈਗਾ 1+1 ਟੀਵੀ ਯੂਕਰੇਨ ਤੇ ਇਸ ਤੋਂ ਇਲਾਵਾ ਹੋਰ ਕਈ ਅੰਤਰਰਾਸ਼ਟਰੀ ਚੈਨਲਸ ਨੇ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਅਕਸਰ ਵਜਾਉਂਦੇ ਰਹਿੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਆਪ ਨੂੰ 2020 ਦਾ ਆਰਟਿਸਟ ਵਿਜ਼ਨ ਅਵਾਰਡ ਮਿਲਿਆ ਜੋ ਕਿ ਜੀਵਨ ਵਿੱਚ ਇੱਕ ਵਾਰ ਮਿਲਦਾ ਹੈਗਾ ਅਕਾਦਮੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਚਰਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਅਰਪਣ ਕੀਤਾ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਐਕਸੈਪਸ਼ਨਲ ਯਾਨੀ ਕਿ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਜੋ ਟੈਲੈਂਟ ਹੈ ਉਸ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਸਲਾਮ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ origignality ਹੈ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆਪਣਾਪਨ ਹੈ ਉਸ ਵਿੱਚ ਔਰ ਜੋ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਸੋਚ ਆਫ ਫਿਕਰ ਹੈ ਜੋ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਦ੍ਰਿਸ਼ਟੀ ਸ੍ਰਿਸ਼ਟੀ ਹੈ ਸੰਗੀਤ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕੋਟ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਮੈਂ ਮਤਲਬ ਇਦਾਂ ਹੀ ਮੈਂ ਟ੍ਰਾਂਸਲੇਟ ਕਰਨ ਦਾ ਯਤਨ ਕਰਦਾ ਕਿ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਇੱਕ ਵਿਜ਼ਨਰੀ ਆਰਟਿਸਟ ਵਜੋਂ ਉਹ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਕਿ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਜਿਹਦਾ ਸਦਕਾ ਕਲਾਸਿਕੀ ਮੌਸੀਕੀ ਦਾ ਦੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਦਿਸ਼ਾ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਬਦਲੇਗੀ ਜਾਂ ਉਹ ਉਹ ਨਵਾਂ ਰੂਪ ਦੇਗੀ ਔਰ ਜੋ ਇਸ ਸੰਗੀਤ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਲੈਂਡਸਕੇਪ ਹੈ ਸੰਗੀਤਾਤਮਕ ਲੈਂਡਸਕੇਪ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੈਗਾ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਕੁਦਰਤ ਜੇ ਕਹਿ ਲਈਏ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਬਾਗ ਕਹਿ ਲਈਏ ਸੰਗੀਤਕ ਬਾਗ ਹੈਗਾ ਉਹ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਇਹ ਇੱਕ ਮਾਲੀ ਵਜੋਂ ਉਸ ਦੀ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕਾਰਜ ਹੈਗਾ ਉਹ ਸੇਵਾ ਕਰਦਾ ਰਹੇਗਾ ਸੋ ਆਓ ਆਪਾਂ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਗੱਲਬਾਤ ਜਾਰੀ ਕਰੀਏ ਸੋ ਸਟੈਫਾਨੀਆ ਦੈਟ ਵਾਸ ਮਾਈ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਇੰਟਰੋਡਕਸ਼ਨ ਹਾਂ ਹਾਂ ਵਰ ਯੂ ਏਬਲ ਟੂ ਡਾਈਜੈਸਟ ਸਮ ਔਰ ਵਰ ਯੂ ਬੋਰਡ ਨਾ ਵੈਲ ਆਈ ਕੁਡ ਕੈਚ ਹੀਅਰ ਐਂਡ देयर ਹੈਰ ਦੇ so i knew where you were <laughs> yeah so listen i uh, uh, i have to confess i mean normally when i hear musicians they you know engage me they force me they compel me to pro- you know activate my brain <laughs> my intelligence my uh, intellect and i am sort of and i realize that i'm i'm more than uh, witnessing uh the experience that i could have or i might have i witnessed my cerebral paraphernalia activated and i somehow feel at the end of it that i was somehow deprived of experiencing something but this uh, album that you've published clara i just heard the first one which was mirthil uh opera uh i think 25 uh, number 1 uh widmum i think i had an emotional response to it and i was startled and i paused it i said oh wait a minute i went back i started again i said
um, that's my art. So I'm very happy that um, I managed to communicate to you what I was feeling when I played um, this piece. Mm. I have to say it's very difficult to be able uh, to give this type of emotion through a recording because a recording normally when they're done in studio they're repeated over and over again so what I do with my album so this is my album number 13 I always try to record them semi-live so the emotion that I give into the performance is something that doesn't get um, taken away by repeating it over to try to, to look for perfection because the problem with recordings nowadays, you have incredible uh, editing tools, you have incredible, you know, recordings that are now available to everyone, uh, thanks to YouTube, Spotify, even for free. Um, and that's really raising the bar super high and is making people to forget that the performance, what is going to give you the emotion, as you said, is not given by perfection, is given by a combination of the human soul at the moment of creating the art that is going to come and talk to you. So if you are if you are uh, taking the soul and putting it on a side to just control it with your brain, that's the moment in, in, in when you can actually have a wonderful, perfect example of uh, piano playing in this case, but then it's not the art. The art has to be a combination of heart and brain, I think. That's true. That's true. And, um, but you know, uh, the, um, it's not easy. It's not easy to, as you rightly said, it's, it's, uh, it's a struggle. Uh, especially, I mean, this, 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 uh, in the time, you know, in, until the digital age came when it was possible to um, not to rehearse and you could still publish yeah. records. In the times before that, people really worked hard and they had uh, a hundred piece orchestra or uh, small ensembles or even solos. You had, a, you had one chance. If you made a mistake, you had to start all over again and do the whole piece in one. That yeah. somehow lessened the, you know, it, it made, uh, it was like a shortcut f finally in music for the first time in history. Because before that, until then, for thousands of years, uh, it has been perfection gained. It has been decades spent at the feet of a master and there were genuine people in the past because you couldn't be, you couldn't pretend as a master. No. People, uh, there was a, a very uh, uncompromising and ruthless filtering process and if you were a master you were vetted by some of the finest minds there was uh, I know it's a cliche now uh, you know merit uh, in the name of meritocracy things change but at that time merit was honored until until uh, for example digital age came along and I've been a witness to as a as an um, audio restorer uh, having a very unique studio space in my foundation I've, I've lent out my space to some of my students who are some some are big pop stars and others are classical musicians and I've seen how they rely on retakes or um, okay punch in from here etc yeah. um, the standards have really gone down and what happens is that uh, the, the, the the mutualism of the mind body and soul uh, of the yeah. of the performer is not gained yet it's not achieved that the constellation is not in line yet and it's like a prematurely published thing which is which are it's like a torn I mean it's like not one fabric but cut pieces it's like rags mm -hmm. and tags so I call Absolutely. it uh, ragtag music but for me that was of course you know one good thing in in, in uh, you you being a classical uh, musician you're not relying on digital technology you have to spend those hours and in spite of that i mean there there are uh, friends like dominique du Villoncou, the cellist from france very dear friend for donkey years i mean i've seen that in very few hands where uh, the the intent of the artist is carried to the listener in spite of mm. the handicap of the medium, especially digital yeah. technology, it's not analog, what we're not hearing all the information that you're playing. So for me, it was a shocker. 
quite a shock. I don't know how did you manage it. That's quite a feat. <laughs> did I praise well, you too yeah. much or was it okay? <laughs> well, you know, I never say no. <laughs> <laughs> It's always come. good to receive, <laughs> particularly when they come from a great master like you. You know, I think whatever word you're spending, it's the value is ten times more than anything. I mean, I put at the same level. To be honest, the total um, uh, not um, listener of classical music as someone who is a big master because they get their role the raw um, instinct out mm. of it. And when you manage to touch the raw instinct above the celebrated instinct of the, of the artist, in that moment, really, um, you, you, I think you achieve something that is sort of, oh, hello, meow. <laughs> Spotting us, <laughs> meow. I love cats. I love them so much. They have that way of looking at you, isn't it? That is so She just clever. climbed on the it's table like... and she's, I think, either needing food or something. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not budging, Wonderful. please. Yes, I'm sorry for the interruption. So, but, you know, animals too. I remember once I was um, uh, playing a piece uh, by Bach, a prelude, and uh, there was a dog, uh, the dog of a friend uh, who was, you know, I was at their house and they, I was just playing the piano for them. And the dog somehow started um, singing with the piano. I mean, it was the prelude, that one that does tam ta tam ti tam ti tam ti and the, and the dog was doing, Woo woo. woo woo So I don't know if in another life he was a musician. <laughs> Maybe he was back reincarnated into the dark. It was incredible because he was perfectly in tune. Or maybe Bach was inspired when he composed that prelude yes. by a dark bar <laughs> ululating to yeah. the moon. Who knows? Yeah. There is so many meanings in the music and that's what I love when I play and I think yeah. I hope but that's what is coming out um, I'm not interested just in the pureness of the architecture of the music as it is because any music particularly you know uh, when we're talking about Bach by Chopin too or Liszt or the contemporary composer everyone has a very strong structure that is behind the first uh, inspiration musical inspiration to compose that piece um, but I'm interested in everything else that happened to the musician to the composer in that very moment in their life because I believe that whatever inspiration come to you in that moment cannot be disconnected but everything else that is happening around you so I think looking for that specific um, connection with the human being that is something that is um, transcend the master it goes into the human soul and the human soul is the same from wherever you come from I believe so everyone experience love everyone experience uh, sadness uh, experience loss experience you know joy and that's what comes into the inspiration of the composer the moment he's composing that piece mm. so I think that's what allows me to connect in a special way in a different way from maybe another pianist and that's hopefully what came to you. So for example, this first piece from the album, the one that opened uh, my album dedicated to Clara Schumann, mm -hmm. it's called Dedication. So yeah. Windbung translates into Dedication and is the um, a series of songs that Schumann dedicated to the wife for their wedding. It was his wedding present. Oh, I see. So, so no wonder I, I saw the heart. I See, I didn't know the story. And I said, I, oh, I sent you. <laughs> uh, oh, I sent you the album without the program notes. Yes, um, you didn't tell But me. this album is very special, you know, this, your um, series is dedicated to um, the anniversary birth of the great um, guru. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one is dedicated to the 200 years birth anniversary of Clara Schumann. 
And so Clara Schumann was the wife of Robert Schumann. Um, uh, gossips said that she was also the lover of um, uh, Johannes Brahms, but above all, she was an incredible concert pianist and someone that before the independence of women, the opportunity for women to make a career for themselves, she was actually um, touring uh, all Europe. She was more famous than the husband and she actually brought the fame of the husband by performing his pieces. So um, I've never been particularly, you know, um, attached to um, feminism in playing the piano uh, mm. because I love Chopin. I'm a big fan of Chopin. I'm a big fan of Beethoven. Uh, and I'm a big fan of this little meow meow. What's his name? Her name is Leah. <laughs> Leah, beautiful green eyes, Leah. So and I love that she likes listening to us talking. So that's beautiful. <laughs> so, um, but I have a friend. It's called. Uh, she's called um, Elena Mazzon, and she's an incredible actress. And she wanted to write a one-woman show on a female um, a musician. She could uh, showcase her abilities to play the piano as well. And so she asked me to be a music director and to choose music that would fit with the words that she was going to produce. So she did the strong and long research on Clara Schumann's life biography, all the letters. So she really created something that is now made out of fantasies, really made out of a deep research, both uh, um, uh, biographical and also musical. So she listened to all her music. and. Um, and uh, I helped her with, uh, you know, teaching her how to um, adapt the music to the words that she was saying. And then it was very interesting. She was invited to the women's radio station to advertise her uh, the debut of her play. And they wanted to play some uh, extract from uh, the play. So she had to uh, record the audio of the play as an audiobook. And her abilities as a performer are not at the level to record a piano piece for a CD. So I had to step in and to actually learn the entire pieces. And I realized when I, I put up the program that actually what we used for the play, um, if it was fitting for the beginning, it wasn't actually fitting for the end of the piece. So each piece had a very strong message in it. And I'm going to show you some part of it because it's really interesting. And that's the way I went through the pieces and the way to really bring back Clara Schumann to the 21st uh, century. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something about religion, uh, um, about, you know, resistance, about uh, passion for her work uh, as an artist, uh, as a master. She was a great master herself. And at the same time, you know, having a family, having a husband and um, being a woman. So um, I, I was kind of drawn into this project and, and then I became a big, uh, strong, passionate about it. And um, uh, the last award that, that you was, were reading about, uh, the Vision Awards, was actually given to this album. And um, it's it's a very special to have yeah. it. I, I heard uh, the first one and I knew exactly why uh, our friend Juicy Caruso wanted me to, uh, you know, <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I, I understood exactly what she was talking about without uh, uh, telling much uh, about the work, uh, about this album, for example. And mm -hmm. I'm so glad, uh, you know, uh, that 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 she connected us. Alia, mm. ti piace questa signora italiana? <laughs> si suona piano. Si. Capisci? <laughs> and um, so shall we play a bit? I mean, we've spoken about Mirton. Can I, can I share it with, uh, yes. uh, with everyone? Yeah. So let's, yeah. Uh, let's have a look. And, uh, and 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 then where are we? Uh, here we go.
thing and um, uh, in fact, oh, hi Juicy, you're here, good morning, she says, Super Maestro and Stefania, great and passionate con- interpretation of Clara Vick Schumann, that's wonderful, that's uh, so fantastic. I'm so glad uh, to see you and uh, to see you, I mean, through your texts. <laughs> and um, uh, so uh, this was, uh, did you play yourself? I mean, can you touch the key on the piano? <laughs> Actually, you know how to touch it. <laughs> I can play. <laughs> you can. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to play something for you. I'm going to guide you through one of the pieces that uh-huh. I love the most. Uh, uh-huh. I mean, um, Clara Schumann. So she, this, this piece that we just heard uh, is in the transcription by Franz Liszt who was a friend of the family, but in a way they didn't like uh, Liszt because he was too flamboyant. So I he, see. for them, he <laughs> he made the piece too big. And But you know, I like Virtuoso and I like yeah. Liszt. So I really <laughs> loved this version. I see. <laughs> that is still the beauty, I believe, of mm. the love, of the first love, mm. you know, of, uh, of uh, Schumann to uh, bride to be. Uh, but funny enough, uh, so Schumann composed uh, um, a carnival that is one of my favorite pieces ever uh, in his repertoire. Um, um, that starts with the, um, I mean, he finished with the David Spundler dance. Um, so it's the march of the Philistines against uh, um, the David Spundler. And uh, it's something really about the masters, the intellectual going against the new wave of um, uh, musicians and intellectuals that they were taking away some of the um, architecture. So it goes perfect with uh, what we're doing with your uh, um, series, you know, about being these symposiums of minds, right, of uh, arts and uh, um, and. Uh, uh, a philological approach and everything that has to to make um, music not just uh, an instinct but actually something that is much more complex uh, and from our point of view <laughs> but funny enough so this uh, carnaval it's um it's um uh, that is actually from the cover uh, the picture that you put on the poster so i have a mask on it <laughs> yeah. uh, because it was for the album called uh, um, Carnival, mm. and uh, this is about the, the characters of the carnival in, in the real life of um, uh, Robert Schumann. So among the various um, characters, there is one called Chiarina, that is uh, his um, a representation of the wife Clara. And it's very funny because although the first piece that we heard is very um, uh, loving and, de- and dear, you know, and beautiful, this one. <laughs> it was like that. I'm showing the actual photo right now. <laughs> in, the, in color. I'm showing the photo in color. <laughs> so everybody can actually see the, uh, the what you were talking about, the car. Yeah, the actual color. <laughs> because I made it black and black. <laughs> They used that cover for when I went to perform Rachmaninoff in Finland. So they loved the picture and they put it like a big uh, poster uh, everywhere. <laughs> and then people expected me to go on stage with my face masked uh, and their hair crazy. <laughs> and I was like, no, that was specific for a specific album, for a specific meanings, and was about, you know, masking yourself on, on, on the many characters that are in the carnival. So as I was saying, so this is Chiarina, so that's uh, um, the piece that Robert dedicated in the carnival to his wife, his future wife. This is before they got married. And that tells you how was their uh, marital relationship. Fantastic. Fighting with each other, mm. and that's uh, you know historically proven that it was a very you know rock uh, rocking um, relationship. So 
Clara in her uh, uh, romances, she dedicated, let me find it, this is up to 21. She dedicated the three romances to, to Robert. And the number two <clears throat> is like that. So it's to him, right? in her place as in how there's he you know so really you can see them fighting and that finished up so there is this incredible crown stopping there keeping you suspended and then it goes wow. and you will think it's finished they're not going to be together. Instead, you turn the page, and that's why I kept the music, so you can yeah. see, you turn the page, and suddenly it is Allegro Appassionato Major. Wow. So, you know how it is with husband and wife. Yeah. You have your moment where you have crazy <laughs> fights, but actually loves prevails and funny enough the piece continues so it goes back to the argument and you can see that there is something that you cannot really resolve out of it so it goes on and it's really dramatic and so you know that, this is something so people they watch the play of Elena and then they says we want to hear the whole music now you know you've been talking to us uh, you know teasing us with piece and bit so we want to hear the entire piece but elena as she's a phenomenal actress but she's not a concert pianist and this are pieces composed by a super virtuoso concert pianist so this is something that was <laughs> never possible for her yeah. so we ended up doing a double bill so when we went to the grammys in 2019 it was for the 200 years of clara schumann uh, we performed uh, a double bill so she performed the play and then i follow up with the concert with the full <laughs> piece. i see <laughs> and I told the story of Clara from the other point of view. So I actually told the story of Clara through the music. So playing this piece, I would play piece and piece, and then I would let them guess the end. So it goes back to the argument, and I'm going to show you. It's actually even more dramatic because, uh, let me see from here. <laughs> of their love. The sun is shining. <laughs> so really, that's what it is. Wow. So there is a, the piece is very long, it's seven minutes long. It goes from super dramatic, super fight, then a moment in the middle of incredible love and passion and laughter back to the fight because that doesn't go away. 
and then he ended up instead with the major core that means whatever happens still he is my husband I love him he loves me and we we are together were you telling your story no <laughs> Although, funny enough, my husband is a Gemini, like uh, Robert Schumann. <laughs> and when I was working with, um, with Elena, I remember there were some um, uh, aspects of being a mother. You know, I was, we start, Elena started working on this when I just had my baby. And it was very difficult because I had a tour uh, <clears throat> planned from before I had my daughter uh, performing Rachmaninoff and, and I had recordings coming up and I had so many other things to, it, to do and it wasn't simple I have to say <laughs> I don't know how Clara did it with seven kids I know she had nannies and everything but still you know <laughs> yeah nannies and so there was a moment uh, in the letters that are written down from the diary because Clara kept a diary with the husband <clears throat> where um, she was away in tour and the husband uh, sent her a letter saying, you know, whenever I mention your name, your little daughter is waving her hands. She wants her mommy home. And that's exactly what my husband would say when I was away <laughs> in tour. <laughs> yeah, I could, I I could see, much. I could see that there was a little little merger of the two stories <laughs> well you know um, as a performer as a musician you have to identify yourself in what you're playing that is the point uh, you know the uh, in the bani uh, guru nanak's uh, one of the composition says jitatana lage sotana jane you know the one who's touched by an event of life uh, is the one who knows it if, the, if it yeah. is hurt, that only the person who is hurt knows it. If it's a matter of joy, only the one who is the recipient of that, uh, you know, uh, gift of joy or gift of sorrow. Those uh, who have experienced it will be able to tell about it. Others cannot talk about it. So one has to really know the story in essence and one has to have that intimate relationship. Uh, those Those... Protagonists have to come come back alive, you know, you have to allow them to be uh, channeled through your body, through your hands, through your voice. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's not possible to taste them. Yeah. Taste, taste the yeah. nectar the way they tasted it. Yes, and it goes with anything really. When I'm teaching, when I'm giving master classes, that's what I always tell the students. Uh, that one very important thing is to, rem to remember is that we're all different. We all have different experience in life. And when you're approaching and performing a piece, whatever piece it is, you need to find your own story to tell. In this case, whenever I can, I try to tell the story of the composer. And then it goes with the fact that, that of course, I have my life as well, and that goes into it as an artist. So I try to be kind of philological as well in the way I uh, give the interpretation to the, to the uh, pieces themselves. Uh, but at the same time, I'm telling, you know, if I'm teaching someone that is much younger and he hasn't go, has been so lucky, you know, they don't have children, they don't have a husband, or even is a man performing the piece, you can't tell that. But there is other things, you know, there is always a moment in life where you get a fight. If it's not a fight with your husband or with your daughter, uh, it's a fight with a friend, for example, or with your parents, or, you know, or with the bus driver, who knows, yeah. anything, you know, so you have to put your own experience, your own life um, uh, experience and feelings into the piece so that you can communicate that to an audience. And then the audience will receive it from the, their own experience. Mm -hmm. So in this specific moment, I'm telling you the story, I'm telling you why uh, I played it in this way. But when you listen to the CD, you didn't know and you were touched in a different way, mm -hmm. but you were touched. So that's that's the uh, I was about to say that that the uh, it's a proof uh, that I did not know the story. I did not know the piece. Uh, but without me being told, it did not need a language uh, because normally uh, uh, it I mean, it is a uh, it is as intellectual as 
uh, it can ever get. Music is uh, intellectuality or I intellect plus more. I mean plus mm -hmm. um, and, and much more. But uh, we in a way attempt to uh, say that which is ineffable, which is just not possible to say in words. Uh, we are trying to express our experience, experience which cannot be quantified in words or, or codified in words. Um, and if it is, um, um, if, if a thought process has been undergone, I mean, if, if the musician or the protagonist has uh, lived uh, the song, that song, in whichever form it is per performed live or via a recording, as I heard, it does not need any introduction. Uh, that sentiment, uh, that experience is communicated. Uh, so if you need someone to interpret it, to play it, but you need someone who's also a worthy recipient, uh, who can, who okay. can, uh, uh, who can bear witness to what is being had. I think uh, that's why music goes beyond languages, beyond barriers, beyond, uh, beyond uh, um, regions, you know, beyond the locale, small villages or townships mm -hmm. where it's universal. Mm -hmm. And I was so glad well, I to can hear that. I can tell you a story. I was, um, when I was a student at Royal Academy of Music, I was um, renting a wonderful house with um, a group of friends, uh, opera singers, uh, and uh, <laughs> mainly opera singer actually. <laughs> it was a very fun house. We didn't have a television. We would spend our evening, you know, playing together and singing together. It was so beautiful, a bit like in the 1800s, really. And that's all what we wanted. But we were all young at the same time. So it's not something that you can think is just from uh, the great masters. No, I can appeal to anyone really. And so we had this wonderful house where I could have my grand piano. So as soon as I rented the house, I bought the grand piano because as a pianist, you can't really practice on a keyboard yeah. or an upright because the way the strings and the instrument works, the pose that you take, the touch that you use. Um, when you are in the big concert hall as well, you have a specific instrument and you need to practice on a, a similar instrument, you can't do otherwise. So for having such a big house and cheap, we had to be in a neighbor that was a bit rough. <laughs> I have to say. So we had the gang sitting on our front wall because they knew we were just students, so we wouldn't say too much. It was they were quite scary, and they would talk until 2 a.m. in the morning. And uh, but funny enough, when I was practicing the piano, because my piano was uh, in a room similar to this with the bay window on the street, uh, they would switch off the radio and they would listen to me. So once I was running out uh, for a lesson, because I would practice until the very last minute, and then I would run for an academy for my piano lesson. And uh, these uh, um, scary people, they were saying, you know what, I really loved that piece, the one with the stars coming down. And that was Chopin, I think, or at least one of those two pieces I was practicing at the time. Can so you, it was a very beautiful... Can you, can you show us what you were practicing? I don't remember, I don't remember which Madai. one it was. But it was, uh, <laughs> I couldn't be, you know, like these always are. Uh... So they might have thought these were the stars, you know. And uh, but what is beautiful is that it was a piece of classical music, and they preferred that to pop music, uh, hip hop or whatever they were listening to. And they even found the meaning of stars coming down from the sky. Amazing. <laughs> I mean, that's really so it's something that tells you that music has no boundaries. You don't have to have the knowledge to be able to be a recipient of it. If your soul is a good soul as well, because you also have to have, you know, sometimes the appearance, for example, those guys that look scary, but in reality, they, they were not bad people. They never did anything bad to us, for example. So. Yeah. 
I think uh, 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 real music, uh, or when when it is music, uh, it doesn't. Uh, uh, it is not bound by. I mean, you don't need a qualification to be moved by it, or to experience mm. it, or or to taste what it is. If it is uh, music, which is uh, uh, you know a thread uh, with beads of sorrow, you will wear it. You will know exactly what it is. If it's if music is a thread beaded with celebration, you will get uh -huh. it. Uh, you will get it. You will adorn exactly that same garland. You could be a, uh, a, a dog in your case, cats <laughs> and dogs in my life too, uh, or, or people, whether they are. I mean, I've seen at times, uh, I don't know, there was, uh, it was in Maryland. Uh, a very, I mean, this gentleman, Hargrup, uh, he became, he's become a friend forever. But it was the first time I met him and he was, uh, later on I was told that he uh, was a guy who never listened to any classical music. And he was very uh, sort of, almost like an activist against classical music. That's elite uh, music, it's not the music for the masses. And so, mm. so I sang, uh, I had no idea, so I sat there and... I was supposed to be there for 90 minutes. It was way back, 96, 7, 8 or something like that, 97 maybe. Oh. And I started singing some old compositions, originals from the gurus. Uh, I said, oh, this is 15th century, this is late 15th century, early 16th century, late 16th century. And then it was time, I said, okay, I, I guess it's time, I'm sorry, you know, I may have taken five more minutes. And this guy, that's when he caught my attention. I mean, I, many people there uh, in Maryland and uh, near DC. Uh, and he says from the audience, he says, not now, you cannot stop now. <laughs> and he was all tears. And then of course I knew that he had never listened. He said, this is something which I've never listened to. And uh, they just didn't want to stop. They did, uh, and it was not just me, it was the music. Because I was talking about the music, I had analyzed compositions, uh, telling about them, and they were people who had never heard, uh, who were listening to contemporary pop kind of Gurbani or sacred yeah. verses taken. But uh, so it's it's uh, interesting, you know, when we uh, are uh, those fortunate ones who have access to great music. And uh, also that we are also able to analyze it, we are able to weigh it, engage it, and then to celebrate it. And then you come across people who are, uh, you know, coming from different walks of life. Some who yeah. have, uh, you know, who are the perfect snobs, <laughs> who, who have listened to everybody. And they first sit down and listen to you like, oh, what would you play? I mean, I've listened so and so and so and so and so and so. Who are you? You're just a new kid on the block. And then mm -hmm. until you do something, it says, oh, we didn't never heard that before. And then you start rubbing a little. I said, yeah, but, you know, you couldn't have heard it all. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's uh, uh, that's fantastic. I mean, that's a beautiful story about these people who could, you know, know the stars when they had no idea that they were stars. Mm -hmm. So, uh, tell me, I mean, how come, uh, uh, first of all, you are a radio uh, host, you know, I'm almost like very, uh, I, uh, must I feel uh, ashamed that I'm actually talking to a star <laughs> host, you know. You know, I, I, I'm supposed to be in conversation with, with Valentina Losurdo and I am afraid, you know, because she is such a big star for Ra Radio Rai Tre, you know. I think I'm yeah. going to be embarrassed, you know, talking to her. <laughs> so. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't have to at all. I mean, in the end, it depends, of course, how you're doing radio. But um, my radio show is really a conversation. It's really an informal conversation between two people that they want to know each other. That's what is an interview in general mm -hmm. and and that's the way as well that will interest people you know the moment you are natural as you are I mean you have this gift of being able to relate to others and to uh, make them feeling welcome that's that's what you need as a presenter and uh, in my radio program in particular I had people coming and being super nervous to be on on the radio you know your life you know you people are listening to you you can't change what you're saying as well <laughs> 
so it's very it's quite intimidating in, in, in a way and also you have so many listeners and uh, particularly with your uh, um, show with the, with your series you have so many I mean many more than what I could get with the radio <laughs> so I should be intimidated from you <laughs> well but yeah, so in my radio program, what we do, uh, so as I was telling you, it was born with uh, uh, the project on Clara, and mm. I was j just coming back from the Grammys with Elena. So I was going to go to the Grammys uh, with another album, mm -hmm. and um, my husband, last minute, my parents couldn't come and take care of my daughter. She was just two years old. And uh, so my husband has to stay in London with my daughter and I had an extra ticket for the Grammys and uh, an extra place for the hotel. And I said, Elena, why don't you come with me? And we present <laughs> Clara Schumann. And I'm telling you, this was on a Friday. No, it was uh, yeah, on a Friday to take the plane. <laughs> <laughs> on a Sunday, so it was really super short. <laughs> and Ella was like, oh gosh, who, who, you know, you don't get invited to the Grammys like that. And so she dropped everything and came up. She didn't have a dress to tell you for the red cat. And I like, I got plenty, I'll give you one of mine. <laughs> and that was our first experience together at the Grammys. It was quite, yeah, quite funny. And so telling these stories, the radio um, station producer, they said, well, you know, why don't you make a program on women in classical music? Why don't you do that? And so we came out with the title Future Classical Women Awards in the sense that we want the, the women in classical music for, of the future in a way. So today and for tomorrow. And so mainly is um, up and coming artists or artists that, you know, they are uh, right now in the big concert scenes and presenting their latest albums and we don't just talk about classical music we talk about everything else about what it means to be a musician a woman musician what are the pro and cause of the, this career for example you know having to tour and leaving your children at home uh, you know they're sick and you can't be there for them for example or or like i was pregnant <laughs> mm. and i had to go and perform i couldn't say you know i'm <laughs> so this type of, and and before I pass through this um, life moment, very important life changing moment, I didn't think it was much different being a man or a woman. So I was brought up uh, thinking that I had two hands and two arms and two eyes and two ears exactly like a man and I could do exactly the same thing. I just had to work maybe harder to be strong like a man and so you know I, I, my second album was the transcendental studies by Liszt and my dream has always been uh, uh, Schifrin the biggest uh, man name I think I was the second woman to record uh, the transcendental studies by Liszt uh -huh. at the time so it was quite a brave step and uh, and then after when I had uh, my daughter then I realized actually not we're not the same <laughs> <laughs> the fact of uh, having life inside you and then having a life depending on you for forever and ever because once you have a child the child is going to be your child forever yeah it's not that you you know you can just forget about it so it's your responsibility it's, it's a, a bigger life in a way and uh, and so then i understood um and also you know it's not that i i thought it would be easy in a way because billions of thousands of women, you know, from uh, uh, millions of years made children, right? So what, what's so different? So I almost died having my, da my daughter. If mm. I didn't have my daughter here in London in uh, 2014 and it was 100 years ago, I wouldn't be here today talking to you. Mm. So there is these, these situations that you know this life and death experience as well it's incredible the moment i had my baby i thought if i die now it doesn't matter because i create the new life that was my feeling in that moment i didn't know i was actually that near <laughs> to losing my life and then after i would have dreams where i would dream that i was actually flying around and i was dead it was all a dream and i need i didn't survive birth 
you know so this type of experience really change you and and you you cannot you know as much as my husband was there with me he lived through it he actually didn't almost die physically he died with me but he didn't die so um there is this compassion, there is this uh, sharing of the experience, but the experience as a woman of having life growing inside you and then making it, and it's something unique. And so from that moment, I think I become, I became a stronger feminist that I've ever been. So before I was just a woman thinking there is no difference, I, I can be as good as a man and uh, I can have a career as a man etc after I thought no <laughs> it's a different thing and you need to embrace this difference so what I tell a younger female students whenever I have the opportunity I tell them don't try to be as strong as a man try to be as strong as a woman that's beautiful because the wow. beauty of life is that we are different and you have to embrace that you know as i was telling i have i have a dear friend of mine he's a fantastic concert pianist and i always you know mention him and i say he's a brilliant pianist and people say well you're not jealous i mean you're both pianists it's like yeah but he has a beard and i don't so i know that what i bring to music is not what he's bringing to his music and we bring different things and I think they're both beautiful and they're both to be celebrated. So there is no competition anymore. There is the joy of being together and bringing music as much as possible to the world. No, I think uh, what you're, I mean, that's, uh, thank you for sharing that. That, that. that shows the difference. I mean, I uh, have always felt that uh, um, it is a huge responsibility uh, when you are an expressionist. I like to twist the word or use it in a very, very particular manner uh, as an expressionist. I, I don't know how it is used in the West uh, or in the rest uh, of the space. But what I mean is a person who is expressing simply, as, as simple as the, as the meaning of the word express, but it could be an expression by way of colors. It could be expression, uh, an expression by way of a sculpture, uh, an expression by something that is uh, calligraphed in, uh, as, a, as a poem or as, or as a novel or, or a song or an instrument or even silence. Um, but to be one, uh, is a huge responsibility. It's like, uh, uh, because it affects others. It's like smoking. Uh, mm -hmm. Why I don't like uh, uh, people smoking around me is because I say, well, as long as if you were just to inhale it, I don't give a damn what you inhale. But if you exhale it in front of me, I'm going to smack you. <laughs> so don't, 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 or make sure that the smoke doesn't come to me. Mm -hmm. Sit on the side that the wind is taking it away from. But I'm, if I may use that as an analogy, that what we puff out, it's like the virus now. Why we wear a mask? It's exactly that is being responsible. That whatever you utter, if the virus, if you are a symptomatic carrier of the virus, yeah. it is there and it will impact somebody or anybody. It will not discriminate mm -hmm. how it is. It could be that uh, uh, gentle person. Uh, down in the street listening to and, and having uh, and reading the music uh, what you were what they were hearing I mean you were reading the music to play it and they were listening to the music and then reading it I mean what was it there were stars oh I can see this I can see horizon I can see a bird etc so I think uh, in addition to reading the books of uh, music it is also important for an expressionist uh, or an artist to read the book of life uh, it is so very important otherwise it is uh, that 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 expression would be full of hypocrisy that means you you're saying something but you're living something or you're saying something which has no meaning you've not even found a meaning it's like talking about there's a beautiful composition uh, by uh, Bhag uh, 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 
one of the Sufi masters, uh, Pekhan Shah, uh, I don't know, if you can give me D, uh, uh, D, D. It's 15 beats. Um, oh, one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, da, 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 It simply says it's like uh, you cannot say it. Um, it's like the sweet when tasted by a dumb person. <laughs> it's like the, it's the sweet of a dumb person. Uh, mm -hmm. Some things are, uh, some praises are such that they just cannot be said and you can just say mm, 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 at best but they non ci sono le parole no it's not possible mm -hmm. to the words don't exist there no and mm -hmm. that the ineffable that experience of life when you pour in the music that you play that has effect that has impact is what i can see uh, and, mm -hmm. that, and that explains the difference yeah, totally. I mean, I was performing, I told you, I was playing a uh, touring Rachmaninoff, second piano concerto. So I performed Rachmaninoff when I was pregnant. The last time I was seven months pregnant. <laughs> and then I performed Rachmaninoff um, when my baby was just four months. So I just So can we have breath. both, please? Can we have both when you were seven months pregnant and when the baby <laughs> was four? Can you play Rachmaninoff then and Rachmaninoff then? Then I mean, <laughs> it's hard to do now that you can't cancel what you had before. <laughs> but what what happened is that definitely the way you play it then as a completely in that specific moment, that specific piece, I'm gonna record it actually. And it was planned to be recorded in September this year, uh, but then because of the virus, mm. we have to postpone it for later on. Mm. Um, but the way I I was playing it then it was completely the the adage was so beautiful you know you would have to uh, think about uh, the beauty of life and so talking about that there is something I'm I'm working on right now um, that is the Liebestraum by oh, Liszt. Really. So, yeah, I realized, you know, before having my daughter, I was recording the uh, transcendental studies by Liszt. I have an album called Chopin Heroic with the scherzos, the polonaise heroic, you know, everything as the appassionata by Beethoven, <laughs> you know, everything as strong. It's fun. Because I was in this, uh, as I was telling you, competition uh, um, with the big man having the biggest repertoire and showing it, you know, the way I, I can only tell because I am different than anyone else I believe <laughs> and then I realized I actually didn't have anything beautiful and peaceful <laughs> and so and so I thought I have to make something for that my daughter can listen to you know she she <laughs> was a baby and she was listening to me performing like my of with all the battle <laughs> so you know what I need to have something Different. So by next album, it's, it's a surprise. It's gonna be all about um, Schubert and Chopin, the most wow. loving pieces. And there is this wonderful uh, piece. Uh, is the Lieberstraum, the dream of love, and that's exactly, you know, could be, actually, 
he has a sonnet written at the beginning of it. Wow. And the sonnet is very dark. It's about the beloved who's dead. And he's telling the, the, the lover, keep loving, you know, don't, don't forget about me because I'm underground. <laughs> and uh, I know you love me and uh, you know I loved you and now it's time to move over and keep loving. But the piece itself has been used a billion of times in movies and everything, the most passionate, loving mem- moment, you know, between uh, very live people. <laughs> and in this case, I think it would be something I would dedicate, um, actually, this is something I am going to dedicate to my grandma. So oh, right before the lockdown, good. they phoned us and they told us my grandma had a few hours to leave. Mm. And so I flew all the way down to Sicily. She's down in Sicily. And she's 90 years old. And, uh, you know, she was in bed alone and they have a piano. It was their, you know, home house of my dad, who mm. was a musician as well. And so I was playing the piano and I played this piece. My grandma stood up from the bed and came to the living room to listen to me play. It was a sort of a miracle. It was a sort of a miracle. We were all crying. I was playing while I was crying. I couldn't believe it. I'm missing the notes. Because, <laughs> you know, when you cry, you can't see, really. <laughs> and funny enough, my grandma now is very healthy. And the doctors don't know how. <laughs> Beautiful. I don't know. It's incredible. So she had her 90th birth uh, in August, and uh, she's still there. And she's still, uh, she, uh, I was calling her, and she was singing through. So <laughs> mysteries of so life. So that's something new I learned from you today. That when you cry, you can't read, is it? <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't know that part. <laughs> I think no one can, you know, when you get it. Plus, my, my very problem is that I cry all the time. So, and that's a very woman-like as well. So that's what I, I don't like about me, but there's nothing you can do. You know, when, when I'm too happy, I can't stop it. And that just comes down. So uh, maybe when I'm sad, I don't really cry. But when I'm happy, it's just... <laughs> It reminds me of my student, Niranjan, who's uh, an American uh, Sikh. Uh, her mom is my student and she yeah. and uh, her siblings also. But she's the, now a professor, I mean, the assistant. Uh, she, uh-huh. She's working at the uh, one of the universities in Los Angeles. So very first uh, uh, days of the class, and man, there would be many people and I would Many people would be in tears, you know, one would think, oh, that's nice, they're enjoying the music. So here is a young lady, all of maybe 20, 22, uh, I don't exactly remember, but she was very young at the time and is about 20 years back. And then, um, so she was crying. And I thought, that's fantastic. I mean, to have a young person to be moved by the music I'm singing and I later on a day or two later uh, again she was in tears and I just joked I said oh what happened I mean uh, and she said whenever I'm hungry I cry (laughs) (laughs) when she's angry (laughs) I said come on you just broke all the heart I had (laughs) here are the (laughs) the napkins take (laughs) now I know (laughs) So I uh, know that's not my case. That's not my case. I was last time I cried. I was at the Royal Opera House, and I was watching r- right before the lockdown again. Um, and it was Andrea Chenny, the opera by Umberto Giordano, and there was this wonderful aria, La Mamma Morta, mm. and it's something that was actually um, I I took uh, for the interview last week with Vivian. Uh, Iwit, who is an incredible uh, um, uh, stage director uh, for opera and uh, opera expert. And so we chose the version by um, Callas, and we were talking about the impact of uh, opera on uh, on society and uh, on uh, um, you know, politics as well. Mm. Uh, this, this is something that people forget, particularly here in the UK, we had in October some strange um, 
uh, headlines about a musician that they had to rethink, reboot and reskill because during the pandemic there is no concerts and there is no means for musicians to be able to um, survive from their work really. Mm. And um, and so we're talking about the fact that instead music is very powerful and, um, and so we're listening to, I was listening to La Mamma Morta. So after this incredible opera about the French Revolution, there is this um, uh, character, she's uh, an aristocrat who had to flee, flee, you know, the revolutionary people who killed the mother. Mm. And she's telling the story that not only her mother sacrificed herself for for uh, for her to fly to to escape, uh, but then um, the maid who was actually a very good friend, so she was a slave, a black woman, beautiful. She gave away her body to to pay for the medicine so that the aristocrat friend could uh, get better. And and so she's saying, you know, uh, I I have death all around me, but then I felt the light from God who was telling me, I am love, you have to keep living. And in that moment, the composer, uh, first of all, the aria starts with the solo by the cello that is so super sublime really so beautiful and then she tells this story even without understanding the text it reaches a moment where a chords and now that's the intellectual speaking you know it changes from minor to major that's the light is the sun shine coming through and and in that moment it's touching you so deep inside you cannot not cry and I was looking around everyone was crying in the Royal Opera House and no matter how many times you listen to that piece, that moment has so something that is so incredibly chemically, who knows, spiritually uh, unique that it just makes everything to explode. And, um, and that was something very powerful. And I remember as well, I went to Raya Festival Hall and I saw Pollini, another great master, playing the piano. And uh, that was the war, that moment we got terror attacks in London. It was really dramatic mm. moment as well to go uh, all together, being in a concert hall with the risk of anything happening. And um, it was magical. It was this man alone on the stage playing the piano, playing Chopin, actually. It was wow. a, a recital all on Chopin. And you could hear the silence. And then the applause, and uh, it was like we were in a bubble, and the time stopped, and nothing else was happening. And I'm thinking, you know, if all the people it, were put in a concert hall, forced to listen to music, maybe <laughs> we we could manage to cure some soul and mm. and make them understand that life is about this, it's about beauty, it's about. Um, human soul is about spirits, is about everything, not about violence and yeah. war. As Juicy has just written a comment called The Miracles of Music, uh, I think she's yeah. so, so right. we, we sometimes don't uh, realize how transformative, uh, as I always say, it's, it's uh, uh, the, even Guru Nanak's music in, whom, uh, in whose memory uh, or in celebrating whose 550th birth anniversary his music is uh, remembered as being transformative in nature. Uh, yes. There was a cannibal and who was, I, I mean, there are stories from him when he sang, you know. He just sang his song and the, the cannibal uh, transformed into a sage, into a saintly being afterward. Just one song, it transformed, wow. you know. Uh, uh, he was uh, the... the Sajjan Thug was the guy, and he's his Koda Raksha. There are a few stories who was torturing the accompanist, the Rabab player of Guru Nanak outside. Tell me, mm -hmm. who is this guy? He seems to be, is he an emperor in disguise? Uh, he is very, where is, uh, where is his treasure? Where is he keeping? I've checked everything and all the belongings. Who's he? I'm going to kill you. And Guru Nanak <laughs> is singing inside, begins to sing, and this guy is totally transformed. So, an example, I mean, remembering the elders in whose memory we sit together, that music is transformative in nature. It, it transforms, uh, it emancipates, uh, it can... Uh, I wrote um, um, 
a, a small couplet in Punjabi uh, upon my analysis. Uh, uh, it was Lai Malpan Diya, Janamadi Jammi Lahan Diya, Madhur Raag Dhun Pigal Diya, Bani Chital Diya, Aapa Eo Maran Diya. Uh, it translates as the layer, layer, the rhythm, the rhythmic element, the layer, deconditions. It's destructive in nature. You know, it, mm-hmm. the layer deconditions, the rag, the melody smelts, and the cast in the word, uh, one dies, the ego dies. Uh, mm-hmm. It's also to do with the death of the ego, because uh, without the ego relenting, there can be no transformation. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, music touches at very many uh, planes, it can solve the riddle, it can uh, let us out of the labyrinth, that let us Uh out of the maze, open the door and uh, suddenly things are better, clearer. And uh, I think uh, uh, Juicy's uh, note earlier was saying that very interesting this way to elicit the artistic process and experience, this is so, this is important also for students who have to approach new works to be interpreted for the first time or to start artistic research. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, she appreciated the reflection uh, on that. I thought was very, very um, uh, effective. So um, why, you know, you did mention that your dad and your mo- grandma is singing uh, now and she came up uh, <laughs> but uh, is, uh, how come you in music? I mean, was it was it in the family? Were you introduced uh, uh, from well, home, or dad, was it your own uh, calling? Did your dad force you no. into it? No, my dad uh, he's a musician, and um, uh, he is a jazz musician. When he was young, he played classical, uh, so he played um, in the theater for operas as well. He played. Uh, uh, jazz, uh, he had a rock band, uh, so he introduced me to all styles of music really and to appreciate them all. Um, and I wanted to l- learn the piano really. I was watching the American movies, you know, the musicals, and you would see the, <laughs> the great, the grand piano and people sitting at the piano and playing, and I wanted to do that. <laughs> and uh, my dad was like, Well, you need to wait when you're six. And I, I remember I was four and I would make with boxes pretending to have a grand piano and make concerts myself so I always had that in me so that's quite funny and then when uh, when I started I you know uh, at my first my sixth birthday he gave me my very first lesson and then by seven I was in the conservatoire I finished up early and uh, I already started doing concerts and competition and tours so that was very much my career um, at the same time because I finished early I I had time to to study something else so I went to university and I had a second degree in um, in law so I'm also a lawyer <laughs> And it was wonderful because I did my degree when you had to do this dissertation for the research, dissertation for the master degree. Um, I did the research on the right of the musicians. And I found out that the legal um, documents that I was working on at the time, they were all written from the 60s and 70s when you had the big social working revolution. Mm -hmm. So they were things to try to put musicians in a box, uh, Mm -hmm. people working in the music business, in the uh, show business really, into a box that could relate to other works to try to find a regulation that would follow some logic. But it was written by jurists, by people that they were um, intellectual for law, but not for music. So they didn't really know what they were uh, talking about. (laughs) So, for example, one of the funny things I was disputing was the fact that uh, some great lawyer in the in the law was in the ruling uh, was writing that performers like us. Uh, they didn't deserve any right from the recordings, but only the composer, because uh, the performer was like a factory worker reproducing the piece uh, designed by an engineer. <laughs> and I was arguing, you know, the same CD recorded by Pavarotti or recorded by an emerito, you know, mm. a unknown singer, mm. wouldn't sell the same. <laughs> 
So that gave gave me a really strong mind on my new um, uh, big mission, that is to create a new university for uh, classical musicians, uh, classical musicians in the in the uh, large sense of the word. So oh, the university music. in which you're going to compose 500 songs and take all the rights away from the players. That one? <laughs> <Babe>. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's going to be um, a music conservatory. It's called the London Performing Academy of yeah. Music, where we have a faculty from all around the world. Uh, that is going to bring and push classical music to the 21st century and give the tools to the musicians to be able to go into different careers, not just the performing career um, of the music industry, and that including uh, music law and uh, music business, music management, uh, because I can see from my personal experience from studying law at the highest level in the um, Italian university and then having a record label here in the UK, I sit in the committee for the Brit Awards. Uh, so I, I sit on both sides of the industry. I can see that there is a link missing between the two. And this link can only be restored uh, by having musicians to embrace the other side and maybe go and be able to work and communicate between each other. And then together they can really make classical music to be uh, pushed again to the 21st century and be able to reach out to a wider audience. Because at the moment it's stuck into the elite of the intellectual or of the snobbish, as we were talking before, um, that they think a classical music can only be seen as something that was written by, you know, the great, great masters, and it doesn't relate to us because we're not great master. And instead, yes, it was written by great, great master, but it was written about human soul, that is something that you have, that everyone has. And so that's why it's written for you. It's not written for other intellectual masters. It's written for the audience. It's written for the people. And can talk has to be, you know, talk again to the people. And so, yeah, so that's what I'm doing right now. Well, that's fantastic. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about, uh, especially the, um, <clears throat> the business part, I think uh, that's something which is very, very important. People have to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, to be mindful of all that, of, of what the industry is. Uh, how does one negotiate? And of course, you know, with the plethora, I mean, the kind of avenues that there are, uh, anybody with a smartphone is a radio station and a television station. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but... Uh, what is a qualitative product? How do you produce uh, good work? And then if it is a good work, then how do you disseminate it? Um, uh, dissemination is uh, more than marketing. It's, uh, mm -hmm. It is also understanding the market, especially with uh, tradition bearers, it is very interesting. I mean, as a conservator, uh, I have struggled and the reason why I've struggled, the, the, the thing that I've had to struggle with is that I am trying to save or recover the heritage, uh, save the heritage from extinction and recover the heritage which has been left for dead uh, or shoved by the side uh, by the people <laughs> mm -hmm. who have actually uh, by way of their callousness and by way of their ineptitude and ignorance uh, mm -hmm. have uh, nearly killed the music and I'm recovering that literature, that music. So I'm negotiating with always the people who have no value for it, who mm -hmm. have the question mark written on their face. I mean, why are you even doing this? Because this is old. I mean, who cares for it now? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so how do you negotiate uh, with them? And I know that I fail every time because I don't have patience uh, for for... Uh, those who have murdered heritage, you know, who have, yeah. uh, and it's a crime against humanity when you, uh, when you disregard the harvest of centuries ago. Uh, it is, it is uh, even ignorance. I mean, ignorance here in this case is not bliss. 
Ignorance no. means a dead heritage. It translates straight into uh, uh, into into a beautiful uh, gift of Mother Nature. In you know, uh, into into extinction, uh, pushed into extinction. So I I think uh, uh, from the university when I, when we've spoken earlier and that which I have read and I will invite people to visit the website as well, which you will, uh, I'll request you to share momentarily. Uh, the idea of the business part is, I think, very, very important. And the fact that uh, uh, the law, uh, uh, you know, that, that has been, I mean, the copyright laws, etc., the revenue generation, I mean, people are not even mentioned. When I published my, I started a record label, again, I have produced, but I don't know, I don't, I, I know what is it to sell, but I've never had the time. Um, mm -hmm. When I published the um, Rabab, the, the first ever audio, audio uh, industries publication of the instrument Rabab, the Indian Rabab, it had never been published before. I gave a, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a booklet. So I gave one full page to the percussionist. Uh, my very different friend Moonsham Sharma, he is a photo, he was tuning I mean, in the studios that I had directed and with a little uh, introduction of his. You find, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, uh, you see uh, Enrico Caruso records, old records, you know, yeah. or anybody else. You just see the star's name, but not all the people who were there as well. Yeah. Here you find a record, you know, no, not even a mention, forget about the percussionist. And one of some of the legendary names uh, who are playing along in a uh, in a recording by a vocalist or by an instrument player, their name names are not even mentioned. Uh, people don't even know. So I think that's that's fantastic. What you do? Well, yes. I mean, thank you. Well, the, I think it's really much needed. That's the problem. And uh, I don't expect people coming out from the conservatoire to become music lawyer. But I want to give them the tools to understand when they talk with the lawyer, when they talk with the agent, when they talk with the record label, what's needed from the musician. And then if actually they like it, then, then continue and maybe make a career in those directions. So you would be still in the music industry. This, that is your first call. Your first call is music. So you can't go um, out of it uh, because this is, is really a... a a, a, a call a part of you isn't it music but at the same time you can enjoy you know making the music to thrive to thrive and to restore its place in the society i mean people as i was saying in this pandemic in this tragedy people at the very top of the political um, side they put music among the less useful jobs ever and then I was talking with my mother-in-law. She had an operation two weeks ago. And she said that while she was doing the operation, it was in local anesthesis. It was a, a difficult operation. But the surgeon and all the nurses, each other, they were working for hours on her while listening to music. It was so important for them mentally, for the concentration and everything, of working on the life of a person, of another human being, they had to listen to music. So how can you think to say ever that music is not important? It's the most important thing ever. It's the thing that makes the plants to grow better. When I practice the piano, I have a bird that come on the tree outside my window and start singing with me that they have to send me away because it's distracted me. <laughs> but they enjoy it so much. You see, it's really this moment of connection of the, it's the only moment I think where our soul can sing and come out of the body from the material part of it and really connect with the rest of the universe. So without being necessarily religious, because there is people that are not religious, there are people that the doctor are the most practical people in the world. They talk about life and death as it is eating of uh, you know an ice cream, for example, because it's their frame of mind. But they listen to music while they are operating. It's like, uh, you know, telling that fragrance uh, of flowers is not important no more. It's okay. like telling food that your aroma is, is not necessary. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the taste is not necessary. 
They're telling a sunset or a sunrise that the visual delight is, <laughs> is blasphemy, that I cannot respond to it. Uh, that, that's what music is. Music is the, uh, the greatest harvest of humankind. And yet we undervalue it, under-evaluate and uh, underwhelm, uh, you know, it whenever we see in the hands, especially in the pandemic, uh, uh, you know, timing, uh, times, everybody else is getting uh, the government support. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, uh, you know, for companies, they have the list of people who work. I mean, all industries can give their employee, employee list. Uh, but in India, for example, there is no list as such of musicians, mm -hmm. uh, artists, sculptors, potters, weavers, instrument yeah. makers, you know, small time, living in villages. They're, they're not even mapped. They're like people non grata. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they don't matter. They are just there and there's no purpose. I mean, who are they kind of a thing? And they, there's no way that they can be supported. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's very unfortunate. So, uh, the seven years and you're uh, at age six, you are given the first, uh, uh, you know, lesson. Do you remember what lesson was it? Most probably, yes. Which one is Do? <laughs> and then how to play. Fantastic. How to play the five fingers and uh -huh. then both hands, that's for sure. But I remember I was little, We at the time we were living in an apartment and so we had neighbors and uh, uh, the neighbors were sitting in the garden where the children were playing in the garden, right? And I would be practicing the piano while the children were out, you know, and you could hear them laughing and screaming, I was like, yeah, I want to go play. <laughs> But I remember the neighbor would put their chairs, their plastic garden chairs, mm -hmm. under my balcony. And then my dad would make for me to play a concert. So he would say, okay, now we're going to play the exercise number 25. And I would play the exercise number 10. And the neighbors were just laughing to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> It was really sweet, but it was at the same time very encouraging and telling you, you know, these these people that they had no um, music education, classical music, just loving me, practicing the piano. So <laughs> that's uh, my right. earliest memory. Yeah, <laughs> even even uh, talking of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, just to go back for a moment, uh, Raman Kaur, who's an actor, theater actor, and director, uh, and a filmmaker as well. She says arts all over the world. Uh, uh, were put uh, 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 was put as unnecessary uh, jobs, uh, yeah, arts as such. Yeah. Uh, but it's actually the arts that has helped people heal and restore sanity in the world, especially during yes. such challenging times. I think that's uh, that's true. The kind of pivot, you know, the support. It's like the magic carpet on which everybody flies. I mean. That's what arts yeah. is, and music is an integral part. So uh, the um, the exercises number twenty five, etc. And <laughs> so my question is still unanswered. I mean, so you just, I mean, piano is it that from the very moment, very beginning, you knew yeah. it's piano? Yeah. I was very, I had all the instruments. My dad plays the violin. We have the cello. He plays the flute. We got the drums. So, so you had, had all the instruments. But I wanted to play the grand piano. I had an upright piano, but I wanted to play the grand piano, funny enough. So I would put the boxes in the shape of a grand piano and pretend to be C. Exactly, like that. <laughs> <laughs> so we put the grand piano when I was seven, when I entered the conservatoire, the teacher says, you know, now she's going to train as a professional, so she needs to have a professional instrument. I so see. we went to the shop. I chose my very first grand piano. And I remember it was huge, it came with an helicopter, not helicopter, the, the crane, crane, you know, through the window, yeah. And uh, it was the most beautiful thing ever. When I bought this apartment... And you were husband, seven, right? And you were seven. And I was seven. Yeah. And I was seven. 
and as well as was when I bought this apartment, we had this piano and we had nothing else. We didn't have enough money <laughs> for much furniture. We only had my piano stool and one chair <laughs> and the grand piano. I mean, that's the that's something I cannot live without. Yeah. And um, it's something that was in the play as well. I gave that to, to Elena when she wrote about Clara Schumann. Um, the, the fact that I couldn't practice the piano, maybe because I was too busy building up the conservatory as well. You know, when you are, it's a huge, massive um, project. And um, on the legal side of it, uh, so many policies and rules, and uh, on the administration part of it. Uh, but at the same time, I have to play the piano. If I don't play the piano, I can't breathe. And the moment I'm practicing the piano is the moment. I, my mind can really work. It's incredible. Like the surgeon in the <laughs> surgery room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, That's exactly. the moment the best ideas come on. Mm. So, uh, we'll come back to the um, um, study times, the conservatory times. But I want to play um, number three, track number three, Romances, um, Opera 11, number two in G minor. Would you have a problem if I play that? No, absolutely. <laughs> you want to tell me about this track uh, very particularly or uh, before or after? That, that's the one I played to you before is about um, Clara Schumann. Actually, instead of that one, I mm -hmm. would recommend to play the track number seven, that is the Opus 21 number three. three yeah. And this is the one dedicated to, Ro to Johannes Brahms, uh -huh. and actually <laughs> became the soundtrack of my radio program. And it in did. particular, let's listen to it, and then I'll tell you something that reminds me very much the first time I met you, and you were singing to me. And you will hear the melody is not far from um, the language in the man. We sing. Okay.
that was uh, fantastic. What is this piece? I mean, I <laughs> I see like so many parallels. One is the use uh, of the second dha, as we say, ta dha, ah, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it's almost like you, but not you. It's the other, and the emphasis on the second. Dadi takit, dadha, dadi takit, dadha, dadi takit, dadha. Dadha, dadi takit, dadha, dadha, dadi takit, dadha, dadi takit, dadha, dadi takit, dadha, dadi takit, dadha, So it's the other. Tadha kirti 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 so the emphasis is here, but it's not there. That was one. Mm -hmm. it, it, the other thing I felt is like it's as if the ripples are mm -hmm. not. Uh, so something is happening within, <laughs> uh, but the waves are not going away. It's like they're coming in. They're all converging. It's like the ripples are actually converging like within. It's like, mm -hmm. tell me, tell tell us about this. Composition. So, I mean, I'm I'm a virtual, a literal illiterate in these matters, but I'm just responding <laughs> to how the music was for me. Well, the music. Oh, very erotic too. Believe you me. <laughs> it is indeed. I mean, it is. so okay. we were talking with Elena and uh, about the fact, funny enough, that um, Clara Schumann. There was this gossips between of having an affair with. Uh, uh, Johannes Brahms while the husband was in the mental asylum and um, these have been gossips that gone on for forever and ever and she always denied denied it and she exchanged letter with the Johannes Brahms they were very good friends they stayed over the house helping her with the children when she had the most difficult moment when she was touring as well so incredible because you think about great Brahms Somehow Brahms never married. He really stayed faithful to um, to Clara. He had some lovers in the meantime, and then he would uh, show her the pieces he was composing, exactly like the husband Robert was doing with her. And she would say, "Oh, I don't like it," when she knew it was dedicated to another woman. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, right before dying, so she died when she was very old, I think eighty something, uh -huh. and um, like. A month before she was going to die, somehow she felt that. So she asked Johannes to destroy all the letters. So Johannes burned the letters and she threw the letters to the river, to the Ren. And uh, so that no one will ever know what they were telling each other. But then you play this piece and there is no, you know, no lie in that. I mean, this is totally... <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Them doing it. <laughs> Absolutely, in the yeah. middle of the erotic moment when yeah. finally after, you know, so many, she give in and mm. uh, she and they are together. But suddenly there is this surprise in the middle part. So let's say the finish. <laughs> after the erotic moment, after being together, you know. Uh, I would say in the movies from the 70s, it would be the moment where they're smoking the cigarettes. Like, wow, that was... After so much, you know, the conclusion. <laughs> the left hand is totally the man talking and caressing her and then... And then surprise, what? 
exactly from the Carnival by Robert Schumann, from the March of the Davis Bundler Dance. So in the album, I also have the entire Carnival and finish with this march of uh, the Davis Bundler against the Philistines, right? I see. And uh, it's a way. The, 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 it's a way of saying either we can fight against all the gossips, mm. or I will always be the wife of Robert Schumann. So that's why she's putting him in this romance that she dedicated to him after this very erotic romance. Mm. Robert Schumann, she stops and then he starts. And then starts again. No, no, no. So now it's not erotic anymore. Now it's the fight. It's yeah. Robert, it's uh, Johannes Brahms telling Clara, come on, you can't do it. I mean, Robert is not there anymore. You are free. And she's like, I'm not going to be Mrs. Brahms. I'm going to be Clara, Clara Schumann. And so the fight goes on and it's exactly the same as it was before when he said it was a, a loving fight, you know, the erotic fight. And it ends up in a way that when I'm introducing the piece to the audience, I let them to discover, but you already listened to the piece. So how does it finish? Um, <laughs> let me get it. Basta! Vattene via! So then of course if you're listening to this piece and you don't know what it's about, you can I think everyone can relate to the erotic part. <laughs> and it's clear it's a fight. And it's clear it, it doesn't end up well this fight. In this specific case. I took it from the Clara perspective and I'm telling you her story and their story is I'm gonna keep being Miss Schumann, not Mrs. Brahms. <laughs> and so this is, the, this is the soundtrack of my radio program. So the Fantastic. beginning and the end of the radio program is introduced with this. had this melody going that kind of reminded me the first time I spoke with you and you were you know singing some of um, the traditional uh, um, songs and had this very strong similarity and it's funny that they are so much two words apart and instead they're, they're so not much connected so much connected <laughs> yeah Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the um, one responds, you know, one responds. I mean, it, it is not that it, I'm, I'm sort of disenfranchised from uh, understanding it or savoring it just because I'm from Punjab and not from where uh, uh, Clara was from. Um, so I think uh, it's like the air, you know, it's like the air of the sun. It are, these are those shared uh, elements, the shared gifts, which, which, which are not confined. Uh, perhaps they are, um, they're how we transcend our own finiteness. Uh, we are um, um, touching, uh, you know, we, we, ent we enter the realm of the infinite. Uh, mm -hmm. from from silence into silence uh, we realize that journey the, the awakening of a note and the merger back uh, and because it is that generic uh, I don't feel as an alien and I could respond to it and it was amazing for me to hear the story after uh, that what I felt uh, uh, it was exactly that and so much more it was even more spicy than I thought 
so uh, the um, uh, one that I have to now uh, check with Juicy or with you or with uh, uh, maybe Shishya uh, Sriniak or I'll have to now coax. I'm thinking maybe for the title. I, I still don't have a title uh, music for my uh, for the series. So maybe I'm gonna. Uh, I'll have to coax. I'll have to see who my who will do it for me. But that's fantastic too. That to see that you have this. This is the title uh, song for your series as well. Um, so apart from Franz Liszt that you worked on, Schumann, Clara, is there someone that that somehow you identify the most, or you've now? touch the ceiling, no matter which continent you fly, you're okay. One second, I have to switch off the uh, speaker device, one second. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the have, headphones, I have, I have, I have the lived, wireless one. I have lived that. Finished up, <laughs> when I was caught up in Italy, I, was, uh, I, was, I had one headphone, and then I bought a new one. <laughs> That was, uh, uh, you know, we heard uh, by the time you were getting your headphones sorted, yeah. I played the Concerto Opera 7 in A minor to uh, Romance. Uh, very descriptive, it's very, she's very conversant in this. Uh, she's incredible. She, she didn't compose very much, so I think as well, apart from the fact uh, that at the time really there was still uh, some uh, obstruction to women composer, uh, but also, and also she was very busy in uh, uh, championing the, the music of the husband and of Johannes Brahms as well, so she performed the premiere of many pieces by Brahms. Um, but she was incredible, she really had um, very good intuition and uh, the melody was really always very passionate and um, the concerto, this, the, this is the only concerto that she composed and this is an extract from it, it's the uh, initial part is just a solo piano, uh, that's why it's on the album and um, it was um, the orchestration was actually done by Johannes Brahms. Mm. Amazing. So he Amazing. helped her with the orchestration. It's really powerful, very beautiful. So uh, you were asking a very interesting question, and uh, um, would you like repeating it? Which one? <laughs> when I couldn't hear anymore, <laughs> I was. <laughs> I really. I was like, yeah, I wanted to fly, and then I, I just couldn't hear anymore. Ah, the right. problem of technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, the uh, I, I I don't remember that question now. It okay. was uh, something. No it will come. It will come because mm -hmm. I I got really swayed by this particular song uh, that was very descriptive and she's very conversant um, and uh, her 
uh, in descent, she is quite magical. It's the Samagam. It's again, she's causing a ripple which is coming. There's a very particular composition. I don't know if I can, um, this medium is uh, worthy of, uh, when I say it's uh, reversed, um, mm -hmm. uh, if I, let me see if I can. It, it, I don't know, it's, it's, it's odd just to put the drone, but. Uh, I can um, hear. You can. Uh, yeah. It's a late 16th century by the fifth Guru, Guru Varjan Dev. Mm -hmm. um, so, Mohan means an Aavai, Haavai, Haar Kajar Vastar, Haran Ki Ne Udi Ni Udi Ni Udi Ni Kam Ghar Aavai Ri. So, when would the beloved, uh, the creator in this case, it's a sacred composition, divine, Kam Ghar Aavai Ri, that I am all ornate as a bride, O creator, you know, the, the, who is the creator, um, when would you come that I was supposed to be ornate with all the virtues that there are, I've discarded all the vices of the mind, that is, we're talking about the mind, uh, mm -hmm. ego, you know, greed, etc. So it's that ornamentation and the metaphor is used as a bride. So Kabaghar Averi is a very rare tradition in which <clears throat> normally when we say Ah, uh, ah, uh, it's almost A uh, is to be any, but Ja is, uh, uh, is be any, Ja is Y, right? Mm. So normally when we say Ah, uh, it's still a lot of push, it simply means the voice is actually going away from me. Mm. And in this rendition, very rare uh, composition in which I was taught, uh, and then I was able to interpret it after being taught in which the voice is as if you're able to reverse your voice and it's not going away from you, but it's coming back to you. Mm -hmm. I'll try to, uh, I'm sort of very odd uh, singing uh, through the microphone with, with, uh, with these headphones, which basically muffle the sound out. Uh, uh, so this is the melody uh, called Bilawal, or Raga uh, called Bilawal. Instead of when would you come? When would you come and wed me? When would you come and so that I am emancipated? Uh, mm -hmm. It somehow, you know, uh, in her work, I've, I've only heard a few uh, compositions, but I mm -hmm. see that it's almost like the, it's like, uh, as I usually, when I talk about this composition, this particular part is almost like sending the uh, beloved or the lover, uh, the vehicle that don't come up with an excuse that, oh, you know, I couldn't find a cab or couldn't find a flight. <laughs> or couldn't, or, the, or mm -hmm. the weather was so bad that I couldn't walk. He says, I'm sending you the vehicle. Just come mm -hmm. on and just sit in it. And my call, uh, my call is the vehicle. And you just, mm -hmm. just sit on uh, my, my nod, my sound, or my, my intent, my prayer that you come and you will come. I mm -hmm. see that. And it's a very unique uh, handling of how she's able to um, create these patterns of descent. 
Uh, how she touches a note, uh, if she is, I, I don't know the music, but if it is uh, where I saw straight uh, notes like, for example, I'm so near So there's a sudden, she, she almost yeah. like, uh, like an ex-pilot. I can, I can be, uh, make an aerobatic, suddenly you break one, you're about to do and everybody would think you would do that aerobatic, but suddenly you make a roll and you're going in another direction. The way she changes yeah. direction, changes the mood, even changes the subject. Uh, these are yeah. things that strike me the most. I don't know. Tell me if you... Uh, absolutely. If well, she, what I can see from her, is that she has this incredible way of talking. So the way she's composing is really a way like speaking to you. So for example, the third of the romance that she composed dedicated to her husband, so Opus 11, mm -hmm. it's really, I believe, when I play it, I think... You know, the husband, he composed the scene from the woods, the childhood uh, scenes. He had a lot of love for the magical fairyland stories of um, for the children, and so much that he had seven children as well. He really loved children. And you can see that she likes that to him. So this one, the decanty to, to her is the third one. It goes like that. Once upon a time. There was this wonderful land, right? That like It's like I'm telling you a wonderful story, but suddenly there is the cuckoo, and the cuckoo in any language <laughs> somehow this to to give you the idea of someone that is crazy. So it's like kind of like the anticipation of the husband and ended up in the mental asylum to me. If you don't know the story, you might think, okay, now suddenly something is gonna happen. So it's making you very aware. But it's incredible as you were talking about, you know, this change of suddenly direction. <laughs> Then back to and now here the story starts. But it's uh -huh. really, really special. So she has this way of telling you things. And really, you know, she wasn't allowed to say what was happening at home. She couldn't go out and say, you know, my husband is going crazy because people wouldn't want to buy yeah. his music anymore, yeah. for example. She would lose, you know. The, so, so many 
drama and at the same time still you know the moment when he was lucid the love that she had for him and the fairy tale of uh, the children and he Schumann was very special you were asking me I remember the question if I had any other composer it was very um, special to me um, funny enough Schumann has never been one of those because I always thought he was too crazy so by playing I only perform of Schumann I perform the carnival and the symphonic achievements are huge mm -hmm. but they are divided so i have the time to switch from one character to the other one this sonata for example by schumann or any other piece composed by schumann they are changing the characters between eusebio he was his loving side to florestan there was the irrational one uh, fighting to each other inside the same piece and mentally i cannot switch that fast so I cannot really play other pieces by Schumann, although he's an incredible composer, wonderful, etc. So there is reasons why then someone prefer to, there are other people that are, they just specialize in Schumann, for example, and or they specialize on Bach. Bach, I love Bach, he's one of my favorite composers ever. And, but I don't play Bach as the pure line has the great master on the pedestal i play back as the father of 20 million children and who had an incredible life he ended up in jail because he was fighting with the <laughs> you know stories that no one talk about he was a very he was an incredible man and not just the great master so i'm more interested into the human side of the composer that can relate to me as a human and I can then transfer to an everyday person in a way. And uh, but my very favorite composer in general is Chopin. Somehow I have a hand that fits into Chopin's music. So not only for me, it's very easy to play at the same time, it speaks to me and give me enough satisfaction. So while Schumann give me melodies that are so gorgeous, you would die for, and I would like to, to linger on that melody for longer, he's instead switching and suddenly bam, I'm back to another character. And so that's, that's why he leaves me <laughs> short, <laughs> short of breath in a way. Chopin instead give me just the right amount. I see. You know? Uh, of uh, of uh, satisfaction inside the beauty of the whatever melody he is devising. This is one of the most famous pieces ever. because there is too much but each note is changing of the harmony it's something that is touching me that is making me allowing me to switch and uh, in, in channel a new energy into it it's something incredible it's fantastic what do you mean by when you say my hand fits him I mean, that's a <laughs> that's a beautiful expression i understand but i would want you to uh, elaborate on that. Oh, it's very simple. For example, as I was talking before about Rachmaninoff Second Piano Concerto, even Liszt, I'm, uh, I play Liszt, I love playing Liszt, but both the Rachmaninoff and Liszt, they have hands and they were very big. They okay. were really large and they could reach very um, large, um, a longer distance on the keyboard. So for them, certain passages, certain octaves, although they're still virtuoso, they were more comfortable than it would be for a hand like mine, for example. There is some pianists that they have smaller hands. And so these pianists, for example, they can't play some specific piece of Chopin or of Liszt. They can't play the transcendental studies. So they end up focusing their career on a repertoire that is more appropriate to the, com to the comfort of their hand without reaching uh, tendonites or anything and that might be Mozart for example because he had a, a smaller um, 
it was a different way of uh, composing, as you know, and uh, you didn't have the big chords, you didn't have the symphonic yeah. sound out of the piano, or Bach, for example, the Baroque music. Even, you know, when I teach for the master classes, I, I always bring the students, the piano students as well, to try the, the Baroque repertoire or the classical one on the historical instruments. Mm. It's huge, That's it's important, important to understand. Yeah, why the piece the piece was composed on those instruments and had that type of sound on the ear of the of the composer. So it's your responsibility when you're producing it, not only as I was saying, talking about the human side of it, but also talking about the beauty of the life. So for example, very simple back. <laughs> of this line of this staccato that if you are playing it it's beautiful but it's not Bach so it depends what you want to do so in that case my my idea has always been, I've, I've, I'm one of those, uh, you know, the musicians are divided into categories. The one that they choose the repertoire uh, because they love the composer, the philological, the intellectual part of it. And the one that they choose the repertoire because they want to represent themselves as performers. So personally, I am, unfortunately, or luckily, I don't know, of the second part, I have a strong feeling on the music, on whatever I'm performing, and I like to bring it out and give my um, personal view on the piece. But I've always been, I mean, I've been taught and I respect and I want to bring out the original version and idea from the composer. So if I'm playing Bach, I'm playing Bach as Bach. I'm not playing it as Brahms or Rachmaninoff. Mm. Having said that, if I have to choose a repertoire, I definitely go for the romantic one because I am romantic soul, you know, for the symphonic and for the instrument as well. I'm in love with the piano as it is. And now the harpsichord, I love the harpsichord, I love the organ, I love the fortepiano to listen to them as a concept, but my real passion is this this good boy here, <laughs> or lady, however you want to call it. Well, we called it the boy first, so there you go. It's a boy. You're disqualified from the from being a feminist now. <laughs> he, he is my lover. There is nothing yeah. to say about that. <laughs> that's true. I can't argue there. So uh, that's uh, that's beautifully uh, described about you know the relationship. I mean uh, that which you mentioned, what you said about. One is to play your favorites, the other, if I may just underscore, what is the other is that you play because you must play, because you need to learn. I mean, at times you learn things just to learn some of the ornaments that there are uh, placed uh, within a song, within a composition, because those are not available in another composition. And uh, even if you don't, sometimes I have done the same, I have learned, I have had to learn, um, for example, the composition is very rare uh, one, if you can just give the chord on D and the fifth, uh, uh, like keep it sustained, uh, you can play every few seconds. Um, Compositions rare in South Asia of this raga, where the movement of the fifth and the fourth sharp and the mm -hmm. fourth flat. So 
Uh, go straight to the sixth flat. Paris at the fifth. So Paris at the fifth. the fourth uh, is is the only composition and I went to Pakistan to study this from <laughs> Ustad Mahmud Afiz uh-huh. Khan in 97 you know because I heard the composition I said oh gosh this raga the way um, this melodic mode melodic discipline uh, has been explored uh, uh-huh. I did not see uh, there at times. Now, I'm, I don't really, um, uh, you know, empathize with the text, for example. It's ordinary. Mm-hmm. Any, any uh, you know, uh, uh, any love song description. I mean, not my kind of a love song, if at all. Yeah. But the compositional structure is extraordinary. So, I, I appreciate that. I mean, it's important even for the students to look at that, that there are two things. Uh, as my uh, maestro, uh, Ustad, uh, maestro Arjun Singh Tarangar would say, ke mehnat barkhordar aluni sil hai, e ta chattdi pehni hai. He say he would say uh, hard work is like uh, uh, is a saltless stone uh, mm. that you have to lick. <laughs> Absolutely. Hard work well, is like that. So. Uh, there are things that we don't like even or we don't not as much they're all wonderful I'm not saying uh, I, I don't want the students and our friends to ever think that we're not talking about when we don't like it's not because of anything they are extraordinary pieces but sometimes you do because you must Absolutely. Well, no, I mean, uh, Chopin was a big fan of Bach. There is, a, particularly in the third sonata, uh, there is a sort of uh, voices um, crossing, like from the fugue uh, structure that he was coming back to um, to fashion at the time in the 1800s. So the Baroque music disappeared during the classical period and then it came back, was rediscovered. As well, you know, I'm a big fan of Vivaldi, of the uh, any Scarlatti as well. They have, um, particularly on the piano side of it, um, they teach you a way of touching the keys and playing this one. If you want to practice and use so technique is something that you can only learn and you need to master at the maximum in any repertoire and in any direction and you can only do it. so you can't be a wonderful fantastic uh, cl- a romantic virtuoso performer without having the top skills from the baroque from the classical from the contemporary put them all together, combine them, and then you are free to express everything. And these are the bases as well of contemporary pop music. A lot of it, some of the most famous pop songs come from classical pieces that have been then transformed into a pop song. And people think, oh, why do I like this song so much? Like, because maybe it was composed by Brahms, it was composed by Chopin, and you didn't know. So there is so much from the tradition that is what made us today. It's the same with literature, it's the same with art, it's the same with everything really. We, we are not what we are today if it wasn't thanks to what has happened before us. Absolutely. That is true. I think uh, that's very well, very well said. And uh, um, in terms of you know, uh, when you just demonstrate it also, it's also to do with technique. Uh, sometimes, uh, uh, again, I mean, I know that the Western, uh, in the West, uh, again, they're not raga-like modes in which there's a certain discipline uh, where the notes are arranged in a certain discipline. 
and mm. all composers, you can have multiple compositions, but they follow the same discipline, then you don't go um, in, in uh, you know, besides the uh, notes that are established. Mm -hmm. But in spite of that, I mean, there, there are uh, um, the same melodic mode is interpreted in different compositions in different ways. That means if you're practicing in a particular composition, it may not give you a handicap which another composition would give you. Mm. So I think uh, those are also, I, it's not directly related to what you're talking, I mean, what we are talking no, no, earlier, but this is, I, uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, uh, at times very, very important. It's, it's uh, a headache to know a lot of music, but I think there is yeah. a reason why um, uh, it is not possible to just be satisfied uh, with, with, with little. Cheslav, uh, you remember I mentioned him, who's just uh, shifted from uh, Poznan to London, and I want him to, and you guys to meet. He's just written a comment, uh, he says, interesting, he says, I wonder how Dr. Pasamonte would react to the sometimes very banal circumstances that led to the composition of some of the greatest music in history. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the Goldberg variations, etc. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, um, there is a wonderful piece um, uh, by the Beastie Boys. So, you know, coming back to the fact that my husband is American, he was also a DJ when he was younger. So he loves to put on any type of music. And funny enough, after our first date, he put on uh, uh, Verdi Traviata. Mm. Uh, he has a, a wonderful collection of vinyls. And uh, it was a version with Pavarotti, that is my favorite composer, coming from Modena, like me, so kind of my inspiration, really. And, you know, the case of the world. And then he's also played um, a piece by uh, Billy Joel, uh, where there is a wonderful uh, saxophone part of it. And my dad used to play always that piece when I was little. Mm. So, you know, this very strange connection. And then, so I was telling you about this piece by the Beastie Boys, my, lo my daughter, she loves uh watching these videos from rappers of the of today you know this american irreverent <laughs> people so they start i think it's uh, uh I, don't, I don't remember if it's mother of shostakovich at the beginning a symphony and then they go into the rap um so these type of things although they are irreverent in a way to the great master they're actually a wonderful tool to bring in people from different backgrounds, from different uh, um, music culture as well, not to be afraid to, to take the classical music, to listen to it. So these are wonderful ways of uh, feeding a little bit of classical music, of you know historical wonderful pieces to people that otherwise would never listen to it. Yeah. And then they might then be interested in listening to the entire piece. Now, I doubt that someone who's listening to the Beastie Boys is going to listen to <laughs> the full Mahler Symphony or the full... <laughs> but, uh, you know, there is good and bad into that. In particular, there is another song, uh, the one that goes, All by myself, I want to be all by myself. Da -da -da -da. That is one of the... Uh, most famous uh, pop song uh, from uh, San Valentine uh, season, etc. But it's based on the second movement, the Rachmaninoff second piano concerto. So I think there, is, there needs to be more narrative from that uh, to show people, you know, uh, that my, my daughter, she watched back Spani. There is a wonderful take on uh, the marriage of Figaro. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on um, uh, the Wagner, it's on the opera, so there is Bach Spani dressed as one of the opera character. With the... So this is a wonderful, wonderful example of how to uh, make classical music more accessible mm. yeah. and also making people understand that, that it's just music. Mm. So you, you need to open yourself and embrace it and not be afraid of it. Mm. Uh, the uh, you mentioned something interesting here. I mean, of course, in Bollywood, for example, Indian film industry, there's a lot of uh, um, you know uh, inspirations. I mean, straight melodic uh, uh, adaptations 
from Mozart and others, uh, Bach and yeah. others, uh, and you know, uh, turned into adaptive reuse, if I may, uh, use mm -hmm. the conservation uh, architect uh, lingo yeah. or expression. Um, you mentioned that even in the West, by pop music, they've taken at times melodies. Can, yeah. you, give, can you give some examples, if you can think of, of what they've taken from where? Yeah, for example, that's what I just uh, mentioned about the Rachmaninoff Second Piano Concerto. There is as well another group called Muse, that is uh, the, the, the keyboard player and composer of the group. It's a rock group, very, very famous, mm -hmm. um, who is passionate of classical music. So he has one of his very famous songs that finish up with the Nocturne by Chopin. Or, or has again as well another piece is called... Uh, um, like it's, I, I can't remember exactly the title. Uh, sounds like super califragilistic spiralidoso <laughs> from Mary Poppins, but something very intergalactical, you know, these I type see. of things. And that's what is taken from Rachmaninoff Second Piano Concerto. You got the Take That. Uh, they have one song uh, that I don't remember the title. I have to make a list actually. Who is taken as well from a prelude by Chopin? So there is so many, so many out there. Mm -hmm. There is um, um, uh, a wonderful Santana, Carlos Santana. I don't know if you are familiar. He's a guitar player, rock and roll, super famous. Um, and my 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 dad was listening to his latest album called Corazon Espinoso. And uh, Espinado, Corazón Espinado. And that was this song, and I was listening to it, and I started singing after it. And I thought, how do I know this song? It's a brand new song. How yeah. is that possible? And then he hit me. He basically made the song on Brahms, the third uh, symphony, that is one of my very favorites. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. Totally. How does it go? Why don't you that. just show some examples, some, some melody? Uh, to, I do you remember, remember that? No, because when we are talking and we're playing music, no, no, then my memory no. of the music just goes, I, I, be, I promise. No. I know, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm just using But yeah. it's the one that goes, uh, I, I think if I'm not wrong, uh, da, 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 da. No, 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 this is Rachmaninoff. You see, that's what I'm telling you. This is Rachmaninoff, fourth piano guitar. Um, da, 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 di, da, da, la, da, 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 so this is the Brahms symphony, right? Mm -hmm. On that movement of the symphony is the song about, I can't remember which one exactly from the album. Right. Well, that's, that's good to know that it's not oh, just yeah. uh, people here uh, or composers from the Indian film no. industry uh, but there, it, it is a it is a normal thing to do. Uh, but I also uh, uh, Chesler was writing about the uh, the pathetic. Uh, the second movement was quoted in its entirety. <laughs> he was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <not that> <laughs> he says many times. <laughs> uh, what about the Goldberg variations? I don't know actually. I don't know where it has been. Uh, I never. I can't think about it. How That's they came a, along. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah, no, I don't know in which song uh, I did the notice those one in particular. I see. Okay. These are the example that comes to mind. And you've mentioned one name that you mentioned a few times. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, that Maestro would like us to speak about is Rachmaninoff. <laughs> he is <laughs> one of my favorites. So yeah. Um, to listen to that is. Yeah. Um, tell us about. I mean, what is your um, understanding of his work and share some insights about that work and what's what's well what's Rachmaninoff has, well Rachmaninoff he was an incredible pianist he was sometimes dismissed by being too popular because he was making these incredible melodies uh, you know and uh, he ended up in America as you know and uh, uh, so people are dismissing him of not being too enough intellectual. And that's what I love about him is the fact that he can actually talk from his soul and, uh, and he doesn't care about that. You know, he cares about bringing out 
whatever inspiration was in, in his mind without having to be too architecturally complex. Um, the second concerto in particular is something that strikes to my mind because it's beautiful from the beginning till the end. There is so many concertos that I love where the first movement is sublime, the last movement may be sublime, but then the second movement is not as good, or vice versa, the second movement is the most beautiful movement ever, but the first and the last, mm, not really. So you have to listen to the entire concerto because you can't just play one movement or two movements out of it. But personally, as a musician, I don't like that part of that and you can tell uh, my friends they always told me that whenever I was practicing something particularly when it was part of a series uh, uh, you know you can't play the transcendental studies and not play some of the studies and because you don't like them <laughs> maybe you don't play them in concert but in a recording it's your duty to perform the thing in their entirety Right, the opera in the entirety. So Rachmaninoff is the only one that is actually beautiful from the beginning till the end. I see. So that's what I like about him. Mm-hmm. Dan has the problem that had very big hands, so not everything is accessible really. I see, because it, it's ergo- ergonomic, no? because you're touching notes uh, at the time yeah. which is reaching directly. Yeah. Um, there is nothing you can do. I mean, people, people would like to uh, say that the pianist has to play everything, but it's physically impossible. This yeah, is a yeah. very physical instrument, mm. and you need to work with the other instrument that you have, that is your body. Mm. And so you need to realize the, the possibilities or the strength that you have, but also the limitation. So you need to be very careful in choosing a repertoire, that I was saying before, that fits you both uh, uh, mentally, as a performer, as an artist, and physically, because you have a certain hand. So I've seen plenty of time artists trying to stretch themselves, doing things that are too large for them or too small. Mm. Mozart, for example, is something that needs a very um, uh, not small hands necessarily, but something that is very agile. You can't really do it if you have big hands. Like, um, then you have some incredible artists that were able to play everything. But at the maximum uh, of the piece itself, the maximum capability, the maximum beauty that you can reach out of that specific uh, piece repertoire, you need to have a certain physical um, structure. Yeah, a goldsmith's job can be done by an iron ironsmith. The tools are totally different. To fix Absolutely. a ring, you can call an ironsmith with a hammer and the anvil. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So those are so. How do you, in the sense that, are you saying um, that certain repertoire which requires big hands, um, simply because at the pace that it goes, you cannot just jump. There's no time to jump from one place to another. It has to be within the reach of the finger. Mm-hmm. Would it mean that someone with short hands would would be somehow denied to play that? Uh, music uh, at the top level, um, it's just simply impossible or are there ways to manage it? No, there are ways to manage, but you will never reach the maximum beauty and strength of the piece, for example. So the transcendental studies by list, I can just do them, my hands is just big enough. And I, I, I became stronger when I was practicing them, really. My, my sound engineer who recorded other albums for me was like, wow, the sound is so much bigger. And so it went all together. So I grew together with the repertoire when I was uh, practicing and learning it, but I also had a very good way of doing it, it was a technique that would allow me not to stretch too much, so either you're very fast and you can reach out, or you need to have a bigger hand. Mm -hmm. Um, But the way you reach something very fast, um, it will never give you this uh, sound, the round, deep sound that the big chords want. So you need to... To understand, I mean, there is so much music also. Why to choose something that risks to give you tendonite and risk you not to show your maximum potential? Mm. You want to do something where you can shine and be the best so that people come to listen to you and not to someone else that is bigger and stronger, for example. So either you give you are the strongest or you are the most musical one 
but you need to find the the best of the best that makes you unique and worth to be a great master and to have people to come watching you I can't for example when I was watching um, the sprint in the Olympic Games right he say uh, 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 Bolton, right? That was super fast. There is no way I can run as fast as him. There's nothing you can do about it. So why would I want to go and run against him? Mm -hmm. I do something else. I do the long distance, for example. Mm -hmm. There you go. So you need to find your discipline and you need to find your way. First of all, you need to learn how to play everything. Then you need to come to terms to the maximum capacity of this instrument that you have. And then you need to apply to that into the repertoire to make this instrument, the soul, to be able to speak at the highest level. And uh, looking at the pedagogy, uh, when you teach, uh, how do you, I mean, you've got a keyboard in front, you've got two hands, um, ten fingers, and then the feet. Mm -hmm. Can you mm -hmm. show us some of your um, regimens, I mean, when you practice, what are your favorite exercises that you still do. I mean, I uh, uh, know, for example, from as a pedagogue from South Asia and, and someone who's a grammarian, um, people can somehow um, think that certain basics one doesn't need to practice. Uh, <laughs> and even just the basic ah, you know, as a singer, it's ah. Just these, the idea of akar, that there are eight limbs, the talud, the upper palate, the tongue, the teeth, the lips, the mm. complete face, the left nasal, right nasal, and the commun the communion of both, the merge, you know, the sangha, mm. the meeting of both, the talud, jipya, danti, oshti, mordhani, nasika, nunasika, niranasika, the eight limbs of the singing. So, even the idea of thought process of how do you stretch a thread? Uh, mm. So you're just basically spinning the uh, thread. How, uh, what are those vital, uh, this is just one example, the movement of ascent, descent, so the ascendant, descendant and the straight, uh, mm. uh, the, you know, the gaman as we say, the gamak as we say, uh, moving from one note to another in an ascending mm. way, in a descending way, and straight, uh, uh, lean roof as we say, merger from mm. one note to the other. What are the vital, share with us, I mean, as a as a performer, uh, you know, like you and Juicy and Chesla, we're all performers, right? Mm. Um, students are, they have the regimen, you know, they have to do, they've got a classwork, homework, do this, do this, do this, do this. Because there's a scramble, you got you're here for two years or three years or six months course or three months mm -hmm. master class. Do this, the whole thing. Yeah. But when you, as a maestro, when you guys sit down and there's no pressure and you have a performance to lead up to, what is it that what is it you, that you do? I mean, when you just remove all the garb, you know the. When you are you and nobody else, when you don't need even to be told that this is you, within mm -hmm. the confines of your house, within when you are with your, uh, you know, your buddy here, uh, uh, this this piano of yours, this felon, <laughs> felon of yours. Well, it's very simple. For example, uh, look, if you are a young student and you are at the beginning, the you have totally to do you know re your regime of technical exercises and when you reach a middle level my best way of doing the exercise is to do Bach there is nothing better than the Bach <laughs> exercise 
exercise of technique. I love it. The piece is beautiful, is inspiring, and basically it, it was the exercises of the time. So you need to sit down, you can do it slowly. So like that you really get all the blood pumping into your hand, it's wonderful, <laughs> you can see it. And then when you're practicing any type of piece for a concert, always, you have to do it separate hands, That's the, there is no magic into that because it's too complex, so you need to go... with the tempo giving accents that they're not there necessarily and then you can play I love playing everything you know middle speed normally because I'm a fast thinker there is people that they like to go slow I can't go slow because my my, my mind that doesn't doesn't like to concentrate as much so I'm for that's why I'm normally for very virtuoso pieces by the same time <laughs> and hands together, technically speaking, as technical as it was the back. There is this beauty in this uh, uh, motto perpetuum, in this time that doesn't stop, tick tock, tick tock. It's just so, it's kind of hypnotizing you at the same time, it's really something that doesn't go away ever. So that's the part of back that I love, for example, you know, there's so much back that I adore. Um, but I know that my my strength is in Chopin, for example. So. <laughs> And then you do the passages just with the fingers. So first of all, the fingers, and then you can add the pedals, and then you can add the dress to it. And then they make up, and then you're ready for the performance. Hmm. Is it uh, maybe um, for just to inspire students in the idea of practice? Because the purpose when I started the series is again um, to... Uh, to introduce, you know, to to the listeners, mm -hmm. um, the idea of becoming knowledgeable. Uh, what yeah. is knowledge? Uh, uh, how do you create a knowledgeable one? What does it take to create a knowledgeable one? And once you are a knowledgeable one, uh, what what is it that differentiates you from a mere player or a singer? Um, than someone who's, um, you know, in whom, or someone who embodies the essence, you know, of that which is Certainly. being performed. Um, so if you there can, a, uh, yes, go ahead. But there is something very, very important, and I always tell this story. So when I was at uh, Royal Academy of Music, I already had done my concert academy in Italy. I was already doing concert performances and I studied in London as well, both in Italy and then when I came to London and then when I went to France as well to study the Col Normale. The teachers, they always end up in a moment when they said to me, you know, I taught you everything. You know what you have to do, just do it. And that was the moment I knew the teacher didn't have anything else to teach me and I I didn't have anything else to learn from that great master so um, first of all be humble and know that there is many masters that they can teach you many things so it's not because these teachers these masters told me I don't have anything else to teach you that meant I didn't have anything else to learn so that's what makes you knowledgeable the fact that you need to keep searching for new masters and learn as much as you can. Once you, you think you've learned enough to then create something to be, you know, uh, a knowledgeable performer, a musician and a master, then you can start the teaching. So that's 
definitely one thing. So what happened is that also when I was so in London, I was performing at the time. Don't ask me to play it now because it's, it's a long time I didn't play that piece and I don't have the music right now, so I can't remember it by heart, but I can sing it. I was playing um, Albany. Uh, a piece from uh, uh, Iberia, the sweet Iberia, very difficult piece called Corpus Christi and Sevilla. And this Corpus Christi and Sevilla uh, is a piece about the Semana Santa, the Holy Week in uh, Sevilla. That is uh, a very specific moment. They have a week of uh, is the passion of uh, Jesus Christ when he goes on the cross. So it's very bloody and everything. And the piece starts ta ta tam ti ta ti ra ti ta tim pa 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 pi ra pi pa pi pa pa pi. And so I thought that was the guitar. So I would play ta ta trim ti ta ti ra ti ta trim. You know the flamenco guitar ta ta trim ti ta ti ra ti ta trim. And the teacher thought, you know, I'm Italian, I have the blood, the passion, a bit like the Spanish. So I had enough passion. It was beautiful. It was perfect. Then I went to Spain for a competition and I saw the Spanish pianist playing the con compulsory Spanish repertoire and they were incredible. They were not all of them, of course, some of them, they were not as good with Beethoven or Bach mm -hmm. or Rachmaninoff, but when they played the Spanish music, mm -hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, I want to learn that. And so I went to Spain to study with uh, um, a Spanish student of a student of Albanese. So I always try oh. to search the tradition. Oh. When I went to France, I was studying with a student of Alfred Cortot, student of a student of Alfred Cortot, who was inheriting, you know, the Chopin repertoire and the French music. So they always told me I couldn't, I was too romantic to play, I didn't have the touch to play the impressionist uh, composers see. like Debussy. And I learned that when I went to France. They had the right way to tell me how to do it. They didn't know the other masters that I met. They didn't know how to teach me that. They just say, well, you cannot do it. And then I went to this great master, uh, Jacques Lagarde, and he told me, you have to do this and that. And it was absolutely phenomenal and when I went to Spain for example the Spanish teacher told me wow you're so such a great pianist you're Italian you're passionate it's perfect but then he told me what was embedded into the music that was the Spanish climate the Spanish uh, you know uh, way of uh, um, expressing themselves etc so for example in this Corpus Christi in Sevilla the beginning, it wasn't supposed to be the flamingo guitar, it was supposed to be the tacones, the eels of the flamenco dancer. I see. So it's completely different. While the guitar is very loose, yeah. the tacones of the dancer are very So, completely different way of playing that piece. And then another thing, the melody of the piece it goes like that and i was living at the time with the spanish singer from um, uh, canarie wonderful opera singer and so she came in while i was practicing and she started singing Tiene la tiara un vestito blanco, da da da, da ri ra ri ra ri ra ra. So she was singing the song. It's like, but this is a classical composition a piece, a piano piece. Like, no, no, this is a nursery song for the girls. <laughs> and this is a nursery song that the girls sing, saying that the girl has a wonderful white dress and she's ready for the party. And this incredible at Albanitz chose this nursery song about a white dress for the most bloody moment of the Passion of Christ. So you can wow. see, visualize yeah. the blood, the stain of the blood on the white dress of the innocent of the little girl. So that's how, what you know, when you become a master, you become a master when you've been researching 
the various tradition all the way of interpretation the reason why the pieces are composed in that way and you go to the origin you don't do it from wherever you are so I definitely advise the students to yeah. travel or to get to, you know, depending on whichever repertoire they want to do, to get someone who knows that traveled for them and has this type of knowledge to pass on. Because you can see, I would see plenty of Russian, Japanese, Italian, myself too, playing the Spanish music, beautiful, but we were never true to the real original intention of the composer. Absolutely, absolutely. But that's beautifully said, beautifully mentioned. Um, ah, there we go. I had the sun and the camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Too much sun today. No, no. So, uh, what what can you? What are you playing for us today? Uh, what's 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 next? I don't know what next. you have in front of you. <laughs> the the sheets. I'm so sort of tempted to like. Uh, just let you roll from the first page to the last. <laughs> okay, well, I can play you the very first one then. Let's finish up with Clara Schumann because we started with Clara. Let's finish with Clara. Oh, and okay. I'm going to play you the very first one of the romance dedicated to the husband. And it's really, it's quite beautiful. It's, it's um, short, uh, but it, it's very demanding you will see hands crossing so it's very special mm -hmm. and at the same time it's very deep musically speaking so this is the first one she dedicated to the husband you can see the the, the happiness of uh, being you know in love of having the husband i mean robert loving her back uh, the fear of the fact that the father didn't want her to get married to, to Robert and at the same time, so you can see this left hand that comes from the bottom, it's like your cautions, your, you know, that is telling you be careful, you know, you should listen to your father, for example, you should listen to your master when you're performing. <laughs> <laughs> what I was being taught to you, yeah. right? And then as well, you then need to be free and fly because it's your life at the same time and you are the one on stage performing. So there is so many, so many things into this. Hmm. Fantastic. <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> fantastic. What a what a what a composition. And of course, fantastic hands. And the touch. I mean, it's all in the touch in it. Uh, how you touch a note, <laughs> how you serve a note. Uh, yeah. It's a key. Um, it is. You know, it is not just in the note, but how you know. It's not in the words, but it's in how they were said. Uh, yeah. They need to be said is the key. And this is not a concert instrument. This is my practice instrument. Yeah, so. imagine. Yes. <laughs> I promise you, it sounds better in the CD. <laughs> <laughs> Or if you listen to me on the concert hall. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We want to do both. About the CD, actually, is it uh, possible uh, your record label is it on your website? Why don't you tell tell us all about that? How can one get uh, uh, your, the CDs? your work? Yeah. They, they're, they're available everywhere. So you can buy them uh, on uh, iTunes, uh, on Amazon, mm. they are on Spotify, mm. they are on uh, all the digital platforms worldwide. Mm. I have fans in Japan, in uh, Canada, in, uh, you know, from all around the world that they, they can get the CDs. And of course, you can write to me and I can send it to you signed if you like. <laughs> it's always quite special. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Now you have fans in South Asia. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, it's a, it's a country I always wanted to visit, actually. It's something that uh, captured my imagination since I was little. Mm. And I have a very dear friend of mine, he's a jazz a trumpet player, he's called Fulvio Sigurta. And uh, he told me about traveling to India to get specific inspiration for the free improvisation. He says that um, your um, musical culture has a, a unique way of counting and not counting in a way. So it's a very uh, special uh, the connection. So between uh, um, the Western and the East, uh, it's uh, huge. And I'm sure I know there is a big passion for classical music as well. Um, so. No, absolutely. I'm very you must glad. Come. Thank you, you must so come. Much. I have uh, worked so with uh, uh, a couple of my friends who are in the, in the U.S. Uh, some of the top jazz pianists. Even they, you know, worked with me in the later '90s, early 2000s, uh, and they were keen. Apart from the improvisation, the rhythmic part was very uh, interesting for them. Uh, it was it was very unique how they were interested in looking at uh, some of the and many of the Indian rhythms have been already used rhythmic cycles have been used nine beats seven beats etc ten beats and so on and so forth or five uh, and then of course mm -hmm. all that goes in between yeah, yeah. and uh, to uh, talking of composers um, you you mentioned about the ones that you like to play. Um, who are the most, I mean, uh, what are the, you know, some of the names are there, right? Everybody knows the name of Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Rachmaninoff, to some, you know, those who are serious li listeners, they, 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 you go into the other names. But are there composers who are not really known, but whose works have somehow caught your eye, uh, who are not as like household names, like star names? like that but because there's so much music that has been written not all is known absolutely absolutely uh -huh. well uh, there is so much really and there is so many beautiful pieces here and there that you can really um take so for sure whenever i go to a concert and i listen to a composer that i didn't know and i like the piece i note it down and I then see. i go search him uh, or her and uh, and study his her music so um i'm big passionate but these again are quite big names in a way um i love piazzola for example uh, i like very much rebecca clark uh, there was there is a new project uh, i'm currently uh, working on i mean many projects <laughs> And Nadia Boulanger as well, uh, and on the line of uh, Clara Schumann. Mm -hmm. um, but for classical, um, more mainstream composer, um, um, I can think of uh, uh, definitely, I mean, Albanitz is not an unknown composer, it's a very famous uh, Spanish one of the major one, uh, Granados as well. Um, in general, um, to be honest with you, I like all the music 
if it's beautiful. I don't mind who is composing it or where, which country it comes from or which um, culture it comes from. What I'm interested in is the message that that particular piece of music is giving and if it's something that fits with my um, belief as well as an artist. So that's what I'm always searching. I see. So there are, I mean, there is, um, uh, the, I know that it moves, but you, it's caught your eye. I mean, you, you do explore that. It's not mm -hmm. just run of the mill. And talking of your uh, being a radio broadcaster, mm -hmm. um, for me, it's been very, uh, you know, I have, uh, you know, been, the oral histories project has been all. As a conservator, I gave up my flying career at age 20. Of course, I, my mom played the drums, the, the Indian Bolak. I copied it by the time I was three. Uh -huh. I got off her lap and I was already copying her work. Then I was introduced to the tabla, like a promotion, etc. Um, music was always there. Um, I discovered, you know, some of the old uh, masters who were mega stars uh, before the partition of India in 1947, uh, but then who lived in anonymity post India's independence. Nobody knew them. The world had changed. So much of, you know, uh, death. It was a destruction. Death and destruction was crazy because the kind of forced migration, ethnic cleansing that happened in 1947 when the in India and Pakistan were partitioned, cut into two. Uh, that kind of a uh, forced migration never happened. Villages and regions which had been culturally so buoyant for thousands of years suddenly went barren and all those who were uprooted did not last more than one generation uh, mm. because that ecosystem was gone. So it's a another study. But I have been discovering, uh, recovering people, the memories of people, many, many elders whom I, you know, discovered uh, are now names that, that history will not forget. They lived in anonymity for decades until now they are they were able to contribute and the future of the classical music that I represent and I mm -hmm. serve uh, will never forget them. Their contribution is so extraordinary, so very unique that the mainstream Indian musicology never had an idea about the uh, concepts that actually govern music until the late, late 19th century, or early 20th century. Um, these interview, uh, these sessions, these are very, again, unplugged kind of sessions where it's very informal, open-ended, uh, as much if somebody's uh, got less time, we say, all right, mm -hmm. goodbye, I, I never wanted to meet you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> if there is extra time, I say, yeah, you know, it's Juicy's intent, you know, she wanted me to be nice to you, so I'm here sitting, you know, <laughs> but I'm like bored to life, etc., etc. How? <laughs> But uh, I, you know, it has always been uh, an ex a humbling experience to uh, bow in front of another lifetime, you know, lifetime work. Uh, and of course, you know, this may seem like anybody's thing. I've done 155, 56 now, but they are very carefully chosen. I mean, I've got more than four, five hundred people who... Uh, would want to be uh, in the sessions or others whom I would want to bring onto mm -hmm. the session. Yeah. But then the cutout range is very particular. It's also because I'm a dedic this is dedicated and they have to somehow, they must have a story to tell. I'm not interested in the flesh only, right? I'm, it's not a catwalk. I'm not uh, a frontline seat, you know, holder where uh, a beautiful model or you know who's going to catwalk in the front it's not a bodybuilding competition or a exhibition where i won so i'm looking for substance i'm hungry i'm like an addict right um it fascinates me when i read i mean i'm reading your book your your uh your life uh, you know harvest lifetime harvest i'm reading it i'm i'm smelling it i'm you know, closing my eyes and I'm able to hear it and feel it. And likewise, I've done so many more and I hope to, lifetime willing, uh, would want to engage. 
you've done uh, and i was particularly taken by the fact that your interview sessions are also um informal they are unplugged and it's a very uh, curious how has it been for you what is like your experience and what does it draw i mean what draws you back into that because it's it's different isn't it it's not about yourself but you're allowing yourself uh to be told the story like i am today i am your listener in chief yes. i'm your spectator in chief and um uh, it is a humbling as i said humbling is one but it is a moving experience also mm-hmm. uh it is it is beautiful it's a gift actually how is it for you i mean uh, you've done it now and although i'm not uh, you know like valentina losurdo said oh you know i would love to interview you but you know my program my producer it's all in italian you know like that so when i do the international one you'll be the first one i said matai now you were there it's all women it's only women now i can't be a woman sorry come on matai this is you know it's like a conspiracy do you see you see what's the problem here and <laughs> so tell tell me about your experience as a broadcaster well, and the kind of pro- people you've met yeah well this program in particular um well i didn't think i was going to make a program to be honest a radio program when they asked me i was like okay why not and um because it's a women's radio station is about championing um uh, the women voice so that's why we interview women <laughs> in particular is quite funny when i interviewed some of the uh, artists that they came on my program they were telling me that they wanted to do something similar for a big uh, television or a radio station i'm not going to mention the name but this big one they said well you know there is not enough women in classical music to have a program just about them so i'm already in my third edition actually so and there is so much more to talk and to say and to explore uh, can, the main uh, problem you can you can whisper the name in my ear <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is uh, so uh, people before uh, the me too movement as well that came out in america you know that was a big blast and this incredible that that to happen uh, in the 2018 i think that was 2018 i mean it's ridiculous it took us this long to say to to stop um men in particular although we know that this happened to men as well yeah. you know it's not the, the main problem is in our art uh, in our business because we're talking about something that you can't really quantify you can't put it on a balance something that either you feel it or you don't feel it we of course you can tell by the degrees by the studies that we've done you know the match knowledge that we put together the research that we've done fantastic but the moment you're performing on stage and the person the audience is listening to it they only see what you're giving out in that very moment and um, often you are in the hand of powerful people that they decide if you can perform or not if you can Uh, give voice to your knowledge to your artistry or not and they use this power in despicable ways as we all know you know they say you know i got uh, 20 other opera singers or pianist or whatever right why would i choose you instead of mm. her or him and so unless your talent is really that unique but even if you have a unique talent i've seen many many artists that they could make it they didn't make it because they didn't have the strength they didn't have the power or they encountered these powerful people that they pushed them down so my radio program uh, in particular want to shine a light on the hardship of women in the classical music um so as an artist is a wonderful journey something that i recommend anyone to take is the most beautiful choice in life that you can make to want to become a classical musician a musician in general but we know it's a very hard very long very you know um 
deep process of learning, of knowledge, of uh, endurance, uh, and of dedication as well, of sacrifice. So we talk about these type of things. Okay. And what is incredible is that although I'm already at the third edition and I, I had more than, it's not as many as yours because it's, it's only once per week. And actually, during the lockdown, we went down to once every two weeks. So, but um, every artist had different journey. They had a different path they've taken. And it's interesting to see, like, each of them, they managed to make it their own way in a different way. And also that they encountered different uh, challenges. Not everyone has the same challenges. I had the challenge of giving birth, you know. I had the challenge as well of changing country coming to this country and then you know uh, so there is many things that come into your way but that you have to embrace this obstacle as something that they're gonna make you stronger and they're gonna make you grow and go to the next level if you don't encounter the steps you won't go above it to then reach the next level so uh, these are all the stories of um, uh, positive stories of um, uh, belief as well in your gift in your mission in your career and uh, they are very inspiring not only for other musicians but also for everyday people that they have their challenges in in their specific job because mm -hmm. each job has their own problems each job has their me too problem each job each person can I, we had people having to overcome cancer uh, one of these uh, singers, she had breast cancer. She had the breast taken off. Now, you can imagine as a, an artist, when we are on stage, there is still the visual part of it. And she was very young. And to have to go on stage, she says, I was just running away and hiding. And then somehow she found the strength and she's telling this story. When she told me this story, I could not cry. It was something that just, I didn't expect it. I didn't, uh, that specific moment, I didn't have the time to research, so I didn't know. And so she was a big champion for that. But that was a wonderful story. Wow. So, yeah, so that's why I'm very happy and honored, blessed, really, to have the opportunity to to shine a light. Not just, it's not just the normal classical music programs, you know. And often... Um, the artist even said to me, you know, no one ever asked me this question. And you know why? Because there were not other musicians, other women that they knew what they've been through. And they knew what would be interesting for others to know, to shine a light on. So normally when you go on a television, on a radio program, you have someone who is a professional presenter. Who someone else did the research and give them the question to ask. So... This conversation I'm having with you is lasting three hours. Is it? But it's lasting three hours or something. But it's lasting this long because you know what to ask. You are a musician like me and both of us, we know where we're going. And so that's why it's, I hope, interesting as well for whoever is listening. Yeah. And um, this is uh, extraordinary. Uh, what, a, what a story. Um, talking of the Me Too movement, you know, there's a, I was in the National Academy of Music, Dance and Drama and the executive is the top body in the country here, uh, directly under the Ministry of Culture. Um, you know, there was a, um, a particular academy where, um, you know, <laughs> The, the bureaucracy had to hide it. Yeah. The, and I fought it. I gave my dissent. And my dissent was also not saved because they did not want to have any paper trail. Mm -hmm. uh, it was one of the sad things and, and I did not want to go back. I, you know, learned about a percussionist uh, um, who was exploiting even uh, underage girls who were mm. learning dance, for example, and who threatened that if he is touched, some of the biggest uh, names in the country would roll. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have had stories where there are singers in the concert circuit, big names like Big, who were, were sick, who were uh, perverts, 
many pedophiles of I mean the worst kind I've heard stories were dirty then there was uh, some people big names again who would uh, a couple of them would call me uh, talking about the top national award uh, for uh, the students who were now uh, some stories came out in the recent couple in the last couple of years when I realized that uh, every time they had called was for a uh, for a late young lady who mm. was being recommended for the top awards and then I was able to tally the insistence uh, mm. that they are trying to lobby for an award fortunately I never listened to that because they were I go by this I uh, my my ways for the national awards were always never supersede if somebody has got merit uh, if somebody's younger, uh, because they were all age related, like until 40, you can give the youth awards. Right. And above that, you know, you have to be for the top National Academy Awards, you have to be over 40. Um, so then there is a priority in terms of age. If there's an artist equally outstanding who's 39, OK, honor that person, because after one year, they won't be able to get that. So if there's yeah. someone younger, you know, let them wait for a year or two because yeah. in terms of seniority, ideas to honor everybody and just because somebody is younger and they are being lobbied for uh, does not make, never made me budge and I often wrote dissent or had to sort of drink poison uh, because there were others who prevailed and oh. voted for XYZ awards and there were several awards which are given every year. And, you know, this whole thing of exploitation uh, is something which is very painful. And for me to hear the stories also from you and, um, uh, and that what you're doing is, uh, uh, is personally very moving for me. Um, the voices need to be heard and I think the fields need to be cleaned up. Uh, if... if you have a genuine relationship, I have no problems, but exploitation and to, to barter it, to, uh, to trade a, a, uh, a personal, a sexual flavor, a favor for, mm. uh, uh, for a job, for a job or for a, for a space on the concert circuit and to be threatened that if you do not do this, uh, if you do not, you know, serve me, uh, uh, that, that there is no future, that your future will be destroyed and that you can touch me. You cannot mm -hmm. uh, accuse me because I'm very big, I'm larger than life and nobody will believe you. And, yes. and there's always corrupt politicians, corrupt uh, uh, judiciary, corrupt bureaucracy, who's always glad uh, because somehow even they get served uh, mm -hmm. by these it's it's like an it's like a syndicate of corruption yeah and uh, it's a struggle one wonders how do you uh, you know it's like a tsunami I mean everybody when you look uh, um, uh, you know it's okay as Guru Nanak uh, I mean one of the gurus have said that hum nahi chage bura nahi ko is a song of humility that I am not uh, I'm not good and nobody is bad that mm. is one. Um, but then there is another line where he says, Nanak Dukhiya Sab san, Sansar. Uh, Guru Nanak says that it seems, you know, just about the entire world is sick. Uh, the mm. entire world is uh, uh, deep down in sorrow. It's a mm. rampant, you know, corruption. It entices people. Uh, money, yeah. uh, sex, you know, sex. Is this the easiest uh, dislodger? It, it, it sort of uh, a power is again, fame is another. People would do anything, and then they would say, "Oh, you know, because they they like to be." I mean, it's a petty and a very dirty. Uh, I mean, it's pathetic the kind of discourse or the kind of uh, the stereotypes that 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 they go. How do you? Uh, I mean, you as a feminist. Also with the all women's kind of a channel that you're doing in, how, what do you say? How do you, uh, what do you say to the young aspiring, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
young aspiring girl child you know a girl mm -hmm. a, a, a young well, woman you know uh, well i i have how do they negotiate yeah. how do they negotiate with this web you know it's it's like a fish wanting to surface on the ocean but then there is a net hmm. well you know um, apart the fact that i'm the mother of a daughter so I'm definitely going to have a very strong talk and the responsibility to make a better world for her. But not just for her, for everyone. My dad had two daughters and he's a bit like you. He is a big, strong, he grew, he grew me up, you know, uh, being kind of um, um, matches, you know, having the worst uh, um, comments on the worst defect of women because he wanted me to be a very strong woman. And I think he really achieved that both with me and my sisters. And he always taught us um, to believe in ourselves and never to compromise, never ever, because that will be the moment you reach. Uh, you know, because he has a very strong sense of justice as well. So that's that's something I always had too since I was little. So I've always been. Uh, that's why I loved uh, studying law at the same time. And I can talk to the younger generation by example. Um, many times, professors and masters that I'm not gonna make names. They told me that I would never make it because I didn't have the right mind for it in the sense that I wasn't ready for compromising in any sense the they life would throw me to me, right? And But then they also said that they did, I didn't need any help because I would make it myself. Mm -hmm. And that would happen. So I really made it myself. I really no one ever helped me. I was very lucky enough to find great masters that they taught me everything they could, but they never helped me. So they had the power to help making my career, to help making the debut here or there, but they never did it. They actually favored someone else. <laughs> One of these, actually, she was a woman, and she told me, you know, you're too beautiful, and you can just marry a rich man. Instead, the poor other student friend of mine, I was next to her, he was a guy, says one day he will have to provide for his family, and no one is gonna help me, so I'm gonna help him. But I always appreciated the honesty of teaching me. So they all genuinely taught me as great masters the maximum they could teach me. And that, that was something that I really appreciated and I'm passing over to everyone. And I'm telling everyone, if you, also I can tell you another story. One of these teachers told me one day, you know, I wasn't happy with the mark that I got in an exam. And they said, you know, everyone was screaming scandals. I deserved much more. But somehow someone else got the top prize. And uh, and I went to the teacher and said, you know what, tell me now if I'm not the top of the top, it's not point I'm dedicating my life to being a musician. You know, I want to be top of the top or otherwise I change career and I become top of the top in something else, for example, being a lawyer. And the teacher told me, you know, you have more talent in your small finger than anyone else in this place. So you also have a responsibility, a responsibility to your talent, to the gift that was given to you. So putting these two things together, the responsibility on the gift that you have as a musician, as an artist, and the fact of not compromising and doing it yourself. I always taught everyone, I had a friend, a cellist, she now had a fantastic career and she had a moment where she gave up. But now that she got a fantastic career, she told me she took me as an example she remembered when we were a student together and I always told her that if you keep going on, if you don't give up, you're going to make it. Because the talent is true and the talent will come out one day. It won't be today, but it will be tomorrow. So I could have made an incredible career much earlier in my life, but I still made a wonderful career and I'm very proud of because I did it myself. So that's what I can tell the younger one. It's that it's possible to just to hold on and not to compromise uh, your personal uh, dignity, personal safety. I, I consider it personal safety. 
because uh, traumas do accumulate. Uh, they mm -hmm. they are burdened. They 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 are carried. Um, that is that is uh, uh, good to good to. Oh, talking of uh, learning, uh, you've uh, had a rare opportunity where I mean where you've been to Santa Cecilia uh, uh, mm. and then you've been to the Royal Academy of Music uh, mm -hmm. and then you've been to Ecole Normale uh, Paris? Uh, uh, in pa Paris you know and, and can you tell us about the experience I mean what did you see as a student of course you know you 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 were younger when you were at the Santa Cecilia you were a little older when you were at the Royal Academy etc but uh, you were introduced you were a young lady at age six you got your own piano <laughs> at age six so uh you were you were grown up enough and you had a, a tough you know big daddy to spoil you for the world so that you were ready you could you could fly you could ride on any any tsunami yeah. that came your way uh, tell yeah. us about your experience and about your teachers and who you've mentioned you know about your teachers quite some um, mm -hmm. Tell us about w what was it, uh, uh, who are the teachers that have, that have meant most to you and what was unique in their teaching uh, and of course the institutes. <laughs> yeah, well, um, for sure, you know, I finished the conservatory when I was young, when I was just 18 and um, I had this uh, opportunity to end up at Santa Cecilia with the Piero Rattelino. And uh, Piero Rattelino is one of the greatest music critics in Italy. Um, and uh, he was a teacher as well in Imola Academy. And um, I, I was lucky enough to study with him. His way of teaching was the way of a critic. So he really taught us how to criticize ourselves. I think that was the best gift he ever gave us. So we would be sitting all together, watching each other performing, watching the lesson, and then we would have to criticize each other. And the way you criticize someone, and in particular when you criticize yourself, is the most important step to then improve. So sometimes you can read um, critics that are not very nice on the newspaper. You shouldn't take them as a bet um, as, as something to try to destroy your career, as something to make you stronger, something to make you bigger. So it's absolutely better to get things that they will make you to improve than to just say every, everyone saying, oh, you're so good, oh, fantastic, oh, beautiful. Because our life is a constant learning, isn't it? It's a constant developing the constant so we're not never arrived until we die we're gonna learn new things isn't it and so that's that's what I learned from him then when I came to the UK uh, what was incredible of Royal Academy is so I finished to study Santa Cecilia and my teacher told me you know you are an Italian in Italy I taught you everything I could teach you and uh, if you want to have an international career, you need to go out. <laughs> so that's how it ended up. So I was lucky enough to be invited. But before we go to before we go to London, let me do a little inspection. Can you show me your face, little like sideways, side profile? <laughs> no, the <laughs> other way to the to the piano, to the piano. Yeah. Visually, let me inspect it. Yeah, I can see that you that critic. <laughs> has, has, has curved your nose a little up. <laughs> I always had <heard> that. <laughs> My dad is the first critic, actually. <laughs> but it's a great thing. I mean, so that's what I always teach the students as well when it comes with the master classes, yeah. you know, to listen to themselves, to watch them. Yeah. Don't, don't be afraid. Yeah of not lacking in yourself, it's important, it's a way of then changing and improving, yeah. so absolutely. I have, a, I'm, I have a repetition of being a, you know, a, a snob in a way, a very intimidating in a way. Uh, so I have many stereotypes against me, huh? they think I'm very difficult, I'm impossible I like that. So in Indian we say it's a nose burnt. Someone with a scorched <laughs> nose is a nose, <laughs> naksara. Naksara means someone yeah. who's a, who doesn't, wouldn't allow anything, who's, who's, who's burnt. No? So I usually tease that it took me a few decades to be that. 
and I'm mm-hmm. not changing my habits no more. <laughs> but, no, no, I. But that uh, you know jokes apart, the uh, idea of I mean, in our school of learning as well in the indigenous pedagogical process that I've revived. Um, a critical res- a critical analysis is very very important, and we would, you know, sit and uh, the maestro is uh, they would say that I'm just a mirror, mm-hmm. and I'm a mirror that will speak truth to you, yeah. and don't ask me to tell you how you uh, are because I'm going to tell you how you actually are. You wouldn't mm-hmm. they wouldn't allow that. And reflection back, and until you gain, they would say you cannot perform until their nod is there, uh, right? And they they would never be satisfied until each time you went, as uh, as I would uh, often write even about it, is that if a composition had twenty attributes, uh, mm-hmm. twenty jewels within, the first time you heard, the second time you heard, you got four or five out of them. But then you have to reiterate knowledge, iterate it, reiterate it, and go back, work on it until you gain all the 20 ornaments that there are. And then I've seen, having spent now 40 years with my elders now, uh, I lost my elder, eldest, uh, one of my elder grand uncles, not my eldest, but my elder grand uncles at the age of 102. He died two and a half years back. It will be almost three years now. So I've seen and uh, what all he could still teach me uh, when he was dying, you know, the last years uh, at age 95, he started teaching me 140, 50 new compositions they had never even heard about before. So, uh, and insights, there were new uh, ideas and so on and so forth. So the uh, millet, as we say, exactitude uh, is something which is very important and that in, in trying to gain that exactitude uh, is criticism, which means that you it's not enough yet. And mm-hmm. many people we've seen would get uh, would just go leave in a huff. They would say, "Oh, mm. this uh, you know this this maestro is just a little too jealous." Uh, mm-hmm. Now the teacher has become jealous of the student. <laughs> These stereotypes uh, are things that I would even often hear. Uh, mm. uh, with regards to, uh, and then other uh, contemporaries of one of my teachers would say, "Oh, don't study with him. He has no. Rep- he's my cousin, but he has no reputation. You see, he has no reputation of actually teaching a student to stardom. So mm. come to us because they knew I was a big fish. You know that if I came belonging to a major tradition, if I'm if I practiced under them." That they would somehow add my name to their harem, you know, yes. to their to their CV. That mm-hmm. oh yeah, so and so is also taught by me. But the idea, uh, what I understood was that the uh, the these masters who were not known to have many teachers had very high parameters, and they would not compromise. They would not nod or they would not certify anyone until they were uh, uh, they were. Satisfied with where the, uh, uh, you know, where the uh, student needed to reach, uh, the yeah. levels that needed to be gained. So that was, I think, very, very important. The very first teachers, uh, uh, teacher that you got in the conservatory was yeah. someone who uh, taught to be a critic. I think that's a beautiful perspective. Um, mm-hmm. Then you went to London. Well, London, what I, I loved was the fact that it was international. But do you, so really, I'm an international, you know, you're Italy. You're the bloody, no. you know, mother and father of what is internet, what is West. What Italy and Greece, you know, as to the East, uh, India and uh, uh, no. China, we are to the, to, the e- uh, to, to the West, you know, we are to the East. No, 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 there is no one who is best of everyone. Everyone is best together. And that's what I learned in London, and that was the beautiful part of it. People, um, it was funny, people would stop me and say, so you are the Italian, I was the only Italian student at Academy from many years. So, And so everyone was really 
curious, you know, and say, so you are the Italian. It's like, why? I mean, I come from Modena. All Italians are different. What is it that I'm just the Italian? How do you recognize me as the Italian? So there was the stereotypes I had to deal with. And then I realized that the stereotypes had um, a bottom of truth in it mm. uh, that didn't want to be, you know, stereotypes can be uh, mean. But in the way they were said in London in particular, they were instead a, a, a plus. They were not a disprejective, but they were, you know, a, an honor of being different. So mm. here there was the love for being different and the fact that you could embrace it and mix. And, uh, and that's what I loved the most. And that's where I, I really managed to, I learned Spanish. There was a big group of uh, Spanish musicians at the academy. And I saw for the first time the Japanese all together that they kept bowing to each other. I found that so charming. It was just a dream come true. So I was in a new universe with people coming from everywhere. I think the good, the lack of the um, UK universities that they speak English and English in a way is a language that uh, is, is taught in many countries all around the world. While Italian is too specific, unless you want to become an opera singer, there's not many, many people that want to learn Italian, you see what I mean? So that's why you, you didn't have that many international uh, as in London. And, and then also in London, what was incredible was the fact that they have so many concert hall and they had so many concerts every single day. So in the beginning, I was kind of like getting drunk of too much music. I was going to too many concerts. I was like, oh, no, I missed this one. Oh, but there is that one. And, <laughs> and then I learned that it didn't matter because they would come back another time. <laughs> so you need to have the space also for yourself <laughs> and for your so it was a very magical moment a very eye-opening moment um, as a performer as well and what they told me in the UK something that I didn't know um, it was the big passion for the beauty of the line something that the English are very uh, special uh, about and so while in the in Italy there was this much ray um, race for being strongest and louder and you know and there is this passion for virtuosism and uh, uh, in uh, in uh, in london is more about in the uk in general is more about the purity of the line the beauty so in a way that really refined me so i thought i didn't have much more to learn uh, on the words of my teacher and it wasn't true i learned so much more here and then even more when I went to France, I was invited first to Juilliard in New York for an artist certificate diploma. And um, I didn't want to go to New York because I thought it was too far away and, uh, you know, I would have to cut the loose or the connection that I made in Europe. That is what happened when I came to London. I somehow cut loose many of the connections that I had in Italy. They came back later on, but you know how it is when you change. And then I thought it was also too far away. But when I arrived at Juilliard, it was so magical. Everyone was so welcoming. It was just incredible. I, I was uh, uh, a friend of a friend from London, from Germany, who was studying at Juilliard. He asked a friend from Juilliard, his piano accompanist actually, to host me while I was auditioning. Mm -hmm. And so she had a flatmate that I never met. So you see the connection, incredible, who left me her bed she stayed over to her boyfriend so I could sleep in her bed while I was it was incredible and uh, and when I was at Juliet for the audition there were all the dancers you know stretching in the something that you did in never Royal Academy Royal Academy is just music you don't have dance and I'm big passionate about dance so seeing all the dancers around I thought oh my gosh this is really a dream then unfortunately they didn't have the money. It was a big scholarship. It was just one place. It was being debited by uh, Carnegie Hall and CD, debit, etc. And so they wrote to me later. They selected only four for the f physical audition in London. And then they wrote to me and says, we love how you play, but actually we don't have the money to run the program this year. <laughs> 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 Can you come next year? Like, yeah. And so I went to Paris 
And Paris, I was so lucky, and I studied with um, Jacques Lagarde, the wonderful, wonderful master, wonderful master, uh, the kindest person on earth, you know, and uh, an incredible no, 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 musician. No, 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 I'm not? the kindest one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not letting go of my title. <laughs> But you know, really, this uh, this master really wonderful, uh, and I only studied with him for a year, I see. and um, and I was already you know doing things here in London. I opened my own academy, so but uh, that year that I studied with him was really wonderful, and I was um, commuting from London with the Eurostar, so going to Paris every other week, it was such a special um, privilege. Honestly, I've been really lucky. Um, really lucky to meet him. What was what was it like? I mean, with especially Lagarde, you know, um, is there something that you can show his touch? I mean, what was the insight that he shared? Does something come there to is, your mind? Uh, uh, there is one thing very very important that he taught me, mm -hmm. and that so that when you're playing uh, very difficult things. So before I was always taught to. Uh, fix the chords into the hands to have them strong and powerful and uh, instead he taught me to play them super soft and super light so mm, I don't have any music right now under I mean I would have to get it but let me see so for example when you get this passage in Lisa It super soft, so that was something that complete, no one ever ever told me. Why did you ah, stop? <laughs> Ma perché? Oh, this is very, very painful. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you better be. <laughs> so, but it's really, isn't that amazing? It yes, makes you amazing. want to, you yes, know, yeah. it's just incredible. So, be, before you reach that, so you really need to play super pianissimo, almost whispering, and then the moment, so you see I was whispering, mm -hmm. and then I could do the crescendo and then come in to the fortissimo, and that's the moment you really, your heart is opening, and you're really ready to get it all, it's mm -hmm. just beautiful. And that's Lagarde, eh? Fantastic. And that's Lagarde. So it's interesting that when you're doing the entire circle from Santa Cecilia to Royal Academy Music, my friend Genia Strigler was, I think, the first Russian saxophonist from right. the Royal Academy. So, okay. um, um, and then you go to Paris where the dynamic range is somehow, you know, that which you were not made aware of earlier. So, if mm -hmm. I may then go back to uh, where you began, I mean, what was it like until you? were there, can you now demonstrate maybe the same piece of how you would have been dealing with this before? Oh yeah, so I would be playing it, so very strong, I'll show you. It would be a sound that can reach uh, the big concert hall. Mm. But something that I learned in Paris is that you shouldn't be afraid of playing pianissimo because the pianissimo played it the right way can actually fly through even farther 
and touch even more than the biggest sound. So the big jumping on it, the big strong chords. There is a moment where you have to have that too. So that's the master who can balance the pianissimo to the fortissimo, to the crescendo, and can manipulate the sound in a way that will give you both, right? And that's what you can notice when you see some incredible young artists that they don't know yet, and so they're just playing too loud or too strong or too piano because they don't have the power even. Uh, you know, it's not because I'm a woman, so that's another thing I learned. So before I thought I'm a woman, I would never be loud enough. Not true. If you're uh, pushing in at the chords in the right way, you can actually create a sound that is even bigger than if you were bigger and strong, just going with the whole weight on it. So that's what I really learned. It's fantastic. Well, thank you for showing that. This is very, very... We have uh, in the uh, Indic uh, grammar, we have um, a triplet. Uh, with mm -hmm. One which is rhythm centric, one which is melody centric. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, a rasva dirga polita. Rasva is nectar, full of. It should be melodious, should be nectarous, it should be mm -hmm. pleasing, tasty in a way. It, it should have a flavor. Uh, dirga is profound, is fortissimo, and then polita is. Mm -hmm. Uh, what you call a pianissimo is the pianissimo. Is a subtle. I guess uh, so. That. <laughs> so the uh, idea of dirga uh, 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 is profound, and then what we call as the niradhar nad uh, is is something very rare, uh, in which uh, let's say if I'm doing. Uh, It's for me. It's uh, uh, startling actually to see that even in the West, uh, the idea of uh, playing the entire composition, it is more difficult because your breath is held difficult. It's so easy to let go. It's so easy to be harsh. It's yeah. so difficult to be polite, to be gentle. <laughs> Prose uh, and abuse is, uh, you know, so easy. <laughs> but it takes a lifetime to understand that you could be poetic too. Uh, <laughs> you could be fragrant too and you could be pleasing too. It takes time, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so for me, it's very moving that 
that that dimension is also uh, there. Lagarde had it and he showed you that. Uh, my apologies, I, it took maybe too long to, dis, to, to share my thought, but it was, it was startling. I, I'm amazed that uh, that discourse is there too. Normally it sets, you know, uh, bum, 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 mm -hmm. bum, 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 you know. Yeah. Um, that's, that's nice. And uh, any musician that you like to listen to? Like, is there someone, I mean, I wouldn't say one person, Maybe you have more because I have more too. But then if you were to ask me, are there someone who I would say, yeah, I would like this to hear from someone. Are there like one, two, three, four people that you... Um, okay. Um, let me preface it. Uh, I often find myself when I'm in, a, in, a, in, an, in, an, in an encounter. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Um, that it, the only thing if I have now learned or the thing that I have learned or studied is the ability to listen. Mm. So if I were to extrapolate that, if you were to extend that, that after all that you've achieved, all the miles that you have walked, all the keys that you've touched, just count for a moment uh, by imagining I am doing that for you and for everyone else. The number of keys that you've touched uh, in the manner that you've touched from being a child, uh, you know, learning the first doll that you showed uh, some hours back <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, to what you've played from, you know, from... At, with the with the insights from Lagarde, from the Pulita to the Dirga, the Pianissimo to the Fortissimo. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that is very evident is that you know what is it now to listen to. Uh, so from that, just remove that hat for a moment of the performer. Mm -hmm. As a listener, when you are just you know, as, as almost the little extension from being that broadcaster, uh, yeah. felon that lives in you. <laughs> Just <laughs> as a listener, after all the journey that you've had, what is, what is your, uh, you know, music, the music that you listen to? I listen to all the music. I don't listen just to piano music, for example. I love violin music. I love opera. I love uh, guitar. I love um, percussion a lot. I'm a big fan of percussion. So, uh, probably because piano is as well a percussion instrument. Yeah. So I have a very strong sense of rhythm. And I love percussion. And I love all the styles. Um, I think first you were asking me if I had other musicians that I was listening to, specifically some names. So definitely I go to the tradition. So my very first, uh, the very first uh, artist I was listening to, to then uh, relate myself and learn how to express myself, it was Arovitz, Vladimir Arovitz. That was the very, very first uh, tape that I bought with um, the words by Chopin that I was learning is uh, the one that I always play to my dad and um, is the dearest piece ever. And then uh, on top of him, I of course uh, love um, Rubinstein, Richter, each of these great um, masters of the past as well, they're all different from each other. So they're all uh, teaching me different things. So you don't only learn by a physical master when you go to Santa Cecilia, to Royal Academy. You also learn when you go to see a concert. That's the moment you're learning, isn't it? When you're meeting with other musicians, you learn from them and the master they taught them. So when I was at Santa Cecilia, for example, I loved to go to listen to the violin lessons by Pavel Bernikov, who is a great master. He was super witty and super funny and super knowledgeable as well. And so he would put together funny things, technical skills that I could apply 
on my way of performing as well, the way of holding the, the line of the, of the melody, the voice, the breathing. I, I had some, um, I would go and listen to the opera students as well. I love opera and the way they had to breathe and build up to arrive to the top note that they have to hold for as long as possible, thinking about Pavarotti, for example. Those are incredible technique. So, and listening to all of them and trying to search all of them and apply them down into these uh, specific instrument is something that um, really shaped my way of uh, performing. Um, Chopin was a big fan of opera singers and they say that all his melodies were really um, composed with the singer in mind so you would have the way of reaching the top note with the piano that is easy, easy to reach but if you are thinking about the singer singing it then it would take you longer and would make you to stretch the melody longer so yeah so i listen to everything really that's fantastic who are uh, your contemporaries that you admire my contemporary if it's not too dangerous a question no, no, absolutely. Um, well, I just recently went to see a concert with a um, Russian pianist. Oh, it wasn't Berezovsky. Berezovsky is a great pianist I really admire. Um, gosh, I can't believe it that his name escaped me right now. Mm -hmm. But I was in tears at the end. I Particularly see. when I got to listen to a piano performance, I am super critical. Unfortunately, I have a very strong uh, opinion in my mind Ask on how. <laughs> I'd on see. how the music should be played and if they miss if they don't breathe enough if they miss you bringing me up yeah. to the climax i know uh, the very I'm first really... singers i listen to the if they're not breathing proper the very first breath i'm off i'm, I'm shut exactly. <laughs> i just exactly. go yeah. I listened to some recording of some pianists, I'm not going to make the name, but for example of this piece that I was playing before to you, no? Uh, um. Without breathing, I was like, <gasps> give me some space, please. I mean, this, this piece is... So you need to have that and then he did the repetition it was exactly identical as the first time so first of all it's impossible he played in apnea from the beginning till the end because it's too long he would have died in the middle secondary is clear that they did the copy cut and copy <laughs> So that's how I, I, you know, I take them out. So when I can't believe this pianist, ah, it will come to my mind. He was just beautiful, really wonderful uh, uh, way of playing. Beautiful sound, strong, powerful, but the pianissimo were uh, equally phenomenal, really. So there are some uh, contemporary pianists that I love I very much. Well, I'm so glad <laughs> to hear that. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I have uh, 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 time until midnight, uh, but uh, <laughs> no. but uh, there's uh, which one would you recommend to play from your album, Clara? Uh, from my album, I want to play one more and um, one more. Um, I think you could play. Um, why don't we play the last one, the, the match yes. with David Sudler contra the Philistines, just to, you know, the apotheosis of our... <laughs> the carnival uh, opera. From the carnival. Uh -huh. Marque, so, Marque des Davids? Yes, that the one? number 32. Oh, the number, number 32, 32. Okay. yeah. You want to tell about that? What, what, what so, yeah, tell, so tell this us? is the march of... Uh, I mean, it's the, the last one, so you have to tell us why it's the last one also. <laughs> so it's the last one of the carnival. So in the carnival, Schumann was putting together these characters. So some of them were, you know, um, because he liked them. Some others, he was criticizing them. So for example, he composed the piece about Chopin, and that's the last piece I'm gonna play for you. Uh -huh. um, but Chopin, you know, he dedicated to him a wonderful uh, uh, sketch, so, and he and he just wrote this to him. He was depicting Chopin as the two. Uh, you know, sweety, syrupy composers like, that is not at all, is a very powerful composer. Mm -hmm.
che ne è super siropi, super sweet. Um, so it's, uh, it's criticizing the competitors and then it finish up the carnival that has uh, that line that Clara put in uh, the romance uh, with uh, Brahms. Uh-huh. So the march of the David Spundler, where he's really saying, you know, um, I am against everyone who doesn't think like us that music should be uh, studied and powerful and you know everything that is to do with culture really the culture against the politician and uh, whoever else uh, uh, dismiss music as something that is not um, valuable as it is so i think it's the perfect and yeah absolutely (laughs) conversation Oh, that's wonderful. So I'm going to play this uh, and then we will say goodbyes after the piece or uh, we can yeah. do that. We can play for now and then <laughs> we'll, we'll meet uh, before we leave. Uh.
this is uh, uh, fantastic. I was uh, reminded of, uh, as I was um, uh, sharing, I thought maybe I'll share it with everyone, that there's a composition by uh, Guru Ram Das, in which he, the fourth Sikh Guru, in which he, um, it's Har, uh, Harjan Bolat Sri Ram Nama, Milsad Sangat Har Tor, uh, tor. Hari uh, Dhan Banjo, Hari Dhan Sancho, Jis Lagat Hai Nahi Chor. This is Chatrak Mor Bolat Din Rati, Sun Ghan Har Ki Gol, Ghor. Uh, but then he says, Jo Bolat Hai, that which uh, is spoken by the Mrig, by the deer. Uh, Mrig mean is the fish. But then you, you may think that these are animals, but then the third one is that, that tells that it's all generic that the deer is representing all the life on the land, on earth. Uh, mean is representative of all aquatic life. And then Pankheru, the winged ones. Then there is no uh -huh. bird being spoken, it's the winged ones. So, bin har japat hai nahi hor. All is the, you know, the omniscient one. Uh, I only, I see them all sing in unison. They're singing the same thing. It's about my beloved. Uh, they're yeah. all echoing. Um, in this uh, piece by um, Robert. Sh uh, Robert, uh, Robert Schumann, uh, one was the Tadha, Kridhe, 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 That pattern, again, what I saw in Clara was a recurring thing that I see that. Do tell us about that. And the other was the modulation that at times when it's very like heavy, Dirga, uh, as we spoke about, like Fortissimo. And then there's a moment when it suddenly becomes, I mean, becomes intangible. It's, mm -hmm. it's like the f fragrance. The flower is no longer there, but the fragrance is still there. It's like, yeah. uh, uh, so tell us about this piece. I mean, uh, about Schumann's, Schumann's uh, uh, work as such, the kind of dynamics he's able to weave within a piece. Well, this is incredible, this one in particular, because it goes really from the fortissimo to the pianissimo, and then and then there is the crazy part, so it's the papillon that you have before in other uh, parts of the entire opera, of the carnival, and you have it as well in other music composed by um, Schumann, by Robert. And of course, this is, um, is, the, is the line that Clara took as it is and put I it in, at the end of the romance with uh, the she dedicated there. But that was a similarity I saw. Uh -huh. See, no, she just took it, this exact note and put them there as a line to say, well, actually, and then it starts again the fight with um, uh, Johannes Brahms. <laughs> Just to remember, you know, wow. um, we can't fight against everyone as well. There might be another meaning to it. There is so many meanings that you can yeah. find to the music. Um, and I think Schumann was an utopistic. He was dreaming, you know, to create a new symposium of mind that, that could change society and could bring I back see. culture. Uh, in his place uh, and his importance uh, to it. I, I think all the artists have always done that. We all always wanted to create something that would make a culture um, to be at the top of everything because I think uh, it goes without saying, um, culture is the only thing that can make us uh, realize the importance and the beauty of the world we live in and not want to go into violence or uh, corruption or anything else that is not justice because justice is not uh, injustice, you know, is not uh, part of harmony and the beauty that is making us to live well. So um, I think what you're doing is a bit like the carnival. So it's this symposium of beautiful mind from all around the world. And uh, that's what I'm going to try to do with my uh, conservatory, yes. the London Performing Academy of Music as well. And, uh, and to, know, uh, to know uh, that life is a gift. It's not a problem. It's not a crime. Uh, it's not a sin. It's a gift, really. And that okay. it's beautiful. This planet Earth is only heaven we know, and we can't be uh, nice to each other on this. Then, as Guru Arjun says, Halat suk, palat suk. If I have peace and happiness here, 
uh, I'm interested in peace and happiness, uh, eternal peace and happiness hereafter. But I need first here, uh, so celebration here. And and I'm so glad to uh, uh, hear you mention about the conservatory uh, uh, that you're setting up. And you, uh, you know, you've brought in, uh, thanks to our very common and dear friend, Roberto Proceda, who's done this software that my classroom, which I've also mm -hmm. tested and in fact recommended to a few uh, maestros as well, mm -hmm. that you actually uh, chosen to connect with maestros who are not just living in London, because that te now technologically it's possible for you to weave a beautiful fabric uh, in spite of the long distance. Tell us about uh, this, this uh, convergence well, of uh, beautiful minds. Absolutely. Well, um, I've been working on it for many years and we were going to have uh, open a wonderful campus here in London. But then, of course, with the pandemic, we were all blocked. And um, I'm, a, I'm a good chauffeur. I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to drive. Uh, <laughs> be the driver, London. be the shopper. In the <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so the, we were supposed to open our campus this September in London, but because of the lockdown, oh, everything has been postponed oh. to next year. But students that they knew about the, this new university, they wanted to enroll anyway online, and it's hard to do um, classes of um, uh, classical music with instruments, you know, at the top level, at top quality. Uh, with through Skype or through Zoom because they compress the sound, so there is some limitation to it. And the platform that uh, Roberto um, developed, it's unique. It goes to the maximum range of the audio, so you can hear perfectly from pianissimo to fortissimo, you can hear the enharmonics, so you can really work and shape and teach how to um, work with the sound, mm -hmm. even if you're not in the same room so that's very special and yeah. when I was able to test the platform during the summer master 0 to 20 did, kilohertz that's amazing I yeah. know <laughs> I did it in July so I had a professor in Tokyo teaching a student down in Abu Dhabi and a professor in Los Angeles teaching a student in Oxford and it was just incredible how in a way we were actually all yeah. together connected as so this technolo technology that has been often, you know, regarded as a um, uh, as a problem in a way, you know, going interfering with the classical performances instead now working for it. And so one of the first things I had in mind anyway for my conservatory was to develop a technological department that would develop more software and more tools that would announce classical music performing and learning as well uh, because there is so much technology for pop uh, electronic yes. music and everything yeah. and uh, but we need that as well for classical and that's really the only way we can push classical music to the 21st century so that's what we're gonna do and so in a way Roberto platform is the la <laughs> is the D that I yeah. was giving you before to then start the yeah. singing all together. Well, that's that's wonderful. I'm uh, really, um, uh, it's really beautiful. I'm looking forward to, uh, uh, you know, uh, hopefully if the lockdown's not there, maybe I'll come when you're inaugurating. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, what we're going to do, we're going to have classes in uh, um, Indian tabla, mm. uh, we're going to have classes in uh, Afro bit music, we're going to have classic uh, music in Caribbean percussion, we're going to have music from all around the world, uh, but not just music, classical music. So, um, um, taking it from the tradition and really bringing the classical music of the 21st century is not anymore only the classical music of the West, uh, of Europe in a way, is right. the classical music from all around the world. So we're really going to create a new universe of classical music. Right, right. No, that is absolutely. And uh, But how do you see the space, I mean, uh, lastly, in the sense that there is so much happening in London, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there are many, many institutes. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, how do you negotiate uh, uh, 
the amount of institutions that there are and you're setting up a new one, what are the handicaps that you faced? What are the, you know, it's, it's not easy to establish something when uh, there are already established institutions. Um, why would someone knock on the doors of an institution which is just new? Uh, yeah. How do you qualitatively, is it the, uh, are you uh, relying uh, on the fact that you're able to connect with some of the top masters, even in spite of the fact that they are everywhere else and it's a place of convergence that you're able to curate, uh, which otherwise an institution may not be able to grant? Uh, well, for sure, well, for sure there is... Uh, the UK conservators are only 11 and they have a strong close number so they have there is a big demand to come and study in the UK in general um, and of course you cannot compete with 250 years of history for example of Royal Academy of Music or Royal College of Music right but what we're doing is something completely different we're not a classical conservators like Royal Academy Royal College we are the conservator of the 21st century so we're the only conservatoire that is totally focused on what's happening in classical music today so they of course we're going to nurture the top quality in performance by having great master to teach for us but also we're going to have these uh, supportive courses into the music industry they're going to enable our students to be able to consider first of all to be able to dialogue and to open a, a, a dialogue you know with um, uh, the music industry in all directions. We're talking about music broadcasting as well, so music uh, production, music uh, technology, music business, music law, but also we're going to have something that no one is doing. So we're going to open our conservatories to the classical music from other cultures, so talking about Indian, talking about African, talking about uh, South American as well, and we're going to have something that no one is really doing and is allowing our students to cross over so to be able to listen to the classes to be part participate in any other class they want to go to so as i was telling you when i was uh, at santa cecilia i was gonna go to listen to the violin classes from this great russian master and everyone was saying why are you here you're a pianist why are you listening to this great violin master and i was like because he's a great master and what he can tell me musically speaking and even technically i can then apply it to uh, the piano and that's something that no one really understood so I want to um, augment that not just for pianists to go to listen to violinists to uh, opera singer etc I want them to listen to the other styles I want them to listen to jazz I want them to listen to any other rhythms from all around the world because together we can create something new that's gonna be really new compositions of classical music new way of performing new techniques that are classical because they, they are drawn from the tradition, mm -hmm. but that they are contemporary because no one has ever done it and it's something that we have to do now because thanks to technology, there is so much globalization of culture and we need to embrace that. So that's why we're going to be unique. So there is no competition with the other conservatories. This is not a Royal Academy or a college. This is something completely new, completely different. That's that's wonderful. I mean, what what an, I mean, I'm amazed at the possibility that you're creating, you know, for yeah. uh, the kind of discourse that is now possible by way of uh, uh, technology. I think uh, the distances are somehow shortened. Uh, yeah. We are all just a click away. Um, yeah. And uh, just to look at just a couple of questions, two, three questions. Uh, one of my very dear, uh, uh, you know, he's like a cousin uh, who lives in uh, England, uh, plays a what? He's a, he's in fact like you. He's a gold medalist from Delhi University, uh, violinist. He's a Indian Indian classical violinist. He's asking. Uh, I mean, first he says it's so amazing uh, that an instrument with fixed notes can produce so much of feelings and moods. It's of course the artist which can make the instrument speak. Uh, so he's asking who will be teaching tabla at the conservatory? 
So we're gonna have two wonderful artists. One is called Talvin Sik, and the other one is mm-hmm. called Coolidge Bambra. Uh-huh. So they are MBE and CBE for their contribution to music and uh, the British culture. And uh, Coolidge, in particular, he is the one who made the notation of the tabla available here, so that people that they don't uh, learn from the uh, tradition will be able to understand and uh, approach it and hopefully use it. Hmm. I see. And uh, oh, that's uh, that's wonderful. And uh, you're initially you're starting with the percussion first, and later on you will you have plans. We to will open up, yeah, with the with the singing as well and other instruments as well. Yes, yes, absolutely. We're, we're going to make it the home of the classical Indian uh, uh, music here in the UK. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, Ramanjit, the actor and uh, theatre director, she says, I love Staf- Stefania's conversational, and she's okay. a storyteller, no? So, <laughs> so she says, I love Stefania's conversational Thank and you. storytelling <laughs> relationships with all the notes that she plays. Of course, it is true of all musicians, but Stefania touches beautifully the transcendental quality of the musical narrative through her explanations and almost make it tangible. Thank you so much. How wonderful. Thank you. And um, um, uh, Poonam Ayub from Pakistan and Islamabad, she says, magical fingers weaving a spell on the listeners. So you've cast uh, a spell on the entire <laughs> s- township of the city of Islamabad. Look at that. <laughs> wow, thank you so much. Thank you. And so um, there are many, many uh, comments, of course. <clears throat> I don't know if Juicy, Juicy must have gotten fed up. Uh, <laughs> uh, she must have run away. But uh, Juicy, we are remembering you, we're teasing you at your back. So <laughs> we we say in India that if if you sneeze, you know somebody must be remembering you. So, all right, okay. so juicy That's must now all the sneezes that you do, we are owning them all. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what else? There are many in Punjabi and uh, um, uh, she. I don't know if I read uh, that earlier. Good morning, Super Maestro and Stefania. Great and passionate interpretation of Clara uh, Black, uh, Vic uh, Schumann. So that was interesting, passionate, it, great and passionate interpretation. How beautiful. <laughs> very beautiful, yeah. very beautiful. Uh, who is this Paolo Passamonte? <laughs> That's my dad. <laughs> it's not writing, is it? <laughs> Papa! <laughs> he says, congratulations, a very interesting interview. But he said that very early. I think even he's fed up from this uh, Sardar from India who's uh, uh, employed as a husband by a Neapolitan girl <laughs> talking to another S- S- Siciliana. Uh, and uh, that's my greetings to you, Paolo. We, we, we were remembering you a lot. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, so... Uh, that's that's no. It's really wonderful that you could take time out. Of course, um, maybe one day, uh, if we can do an extension of maybe uh, not much talk, just some pieces. It'll be okay. wonderful to uh, <laughs> just uh, yeah, just play just introduction to the pieces. It's just like you, uh, you know. When I began to analyze uh, music in terms of uh, uh, looking at the text, the meaning and the composition structure and I wrote in my paper for Routledge, uh, what is Kirtan, when I spoke of what is the difference between a composed song and a revealed song. Mm -hmm. So I could see that if the poetry was of the uh, the composer, it, it is composed differently versus when the poetry is uh, of someone else and you're just a musician doing it. There's, I could see the distance very early when I was 18, 19 year old. Mm-hmm. And I analyzed old music. I saw when there were compositions which were speaking to the mind. Uh, they were composed differently in the three octave uh, because these are to do with vocal music. The mm-hmm. entire three, three and a half octave range. And the ones that were celebrative in nature, they were different. 
when there was knowledge coming in uh, it was it came in a different when it was the master teaching the disciple uh, it was different when it was a pleading a prayer it was done differently certain notes were reserved for a prayer and then when you would receive the boon you would also be on that same note so from the same note for example the third uh, would be the third sharp uh, would be the note of prayer and also of reception receiving of the boon for example and uh, so when i was analyzing most of my family member they said hey uh, singing uh, music is to perform stop talking about it <laughs> until i met uh, elders like pai sekandar singh of bagria and then uh, you know professor sk saxena was a philosopher and aesthetician who did his work on rhythm aesthetics and singing ear analysis he says no 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 don't stop because uh, in south asia and in the field of music the discourse is 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 very important it's a pillar of all expression yeah. all creativity so never so at very uh, early age i was uh, i was encouraged not to shut my uh, you know uh, brain and just be a performer uh to be a thinker and a performer to be an analyst uh, and and yeah. a performer and a composer and if i have then uh you know compose stuff uh, whether it is singing whether or it is percussion mm -hmm. um the poetry because it's based on the analysis of ancient poetry uh my compositions are considered not bad i mean they are considered as an extension of the ancient uh uh, uh methodology uh the 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 the, um, uh, the methodology the pedagogy uh, if one undergoes yeah. you know it's like learning a language if you learn the language well you are creating new poetry you're writing new prose a novel using the same language but it's different it's a different story it's a different no sentence is the same uh, it's mm -hmm. a, it's your sentence like that so it will be great to have uh, you because i see that you uh and as i was introduced that uh you're not just a player you know uh it's like you know like juicy you know her work on the 72 male kartaragas from carnatic music uh she's again a thinking uh musician she's a thinker philosopher and a musician uh yeah. and then to be able to have i think music is different one of the uh former i mean she was the top dancer turn music critic dance critic Lila Venkatraman wrote once after there was a music festival, and her review uh, about one paragraph that she wrote, and she was covering, giving one one line each, but she wrote a small paragraph on, and she it was very interesting. She said that my music was different, perhaps because I was also a luthier, that I had mm. handcrafted instruments back to life. So the relationship between the more we uh, are woven into uh, deeply invested in all facets or the entire ecosystem it it somehow reflects uh, it shows so i'm really keen to maybe steal you for some time and request you so i'm requesting you to choose some pieces and share the insights about them and display uh, for us it will be educative it will be like a master class uh, of how to attend to music that these are not just mere notes that are written uh, mm -hmm. there's something more it's somebody's life it's somebody's future people yeah. who now rest in their graves who have let their five elements merge into the five elements the souls have long flown mm -hmm. yet they are here conversing with us and yeah. waiting for a like minded person to come by uh yeah so i thought that it would be fantastic an opportunity uh for us to benefit from your presence uh, all right well thank you so much yes i would be pleased to come back uh, and share more music with you <laughs> yes absolutely and your dad in fact uh, i'm surprised he he lasted huh? <laughs> he lasted 4 <laughs> hours and 35 minutes paolo i'm impressed <laughs> you're a true sicilian keeping up with the oh, yeah. with the oh, yeah. with the hardcore punjabi <laughs> and okay. uh, uh punam uh, so he's written a comment i'll read that to you but before that punam are you from islamabad writes 
looking and hearing uh, Dr. Stefania, one cannot help but think that besides being super talented, she has been touched by the divinity itself and what to speak of her ethereal beauty and her soulful and passionate eyes. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> and uh, uh, so your dad now says, may I dare read his comment? <laughs> I don't know. What is this say? <laughs> Well, okay, I, I just saw the first line, it said, praise to me, so I'll read it because he's praising me. <laughs> if, if After uh, Poonam's compliment to you, if this was also a compliment to you, I would have really, being a male chauvinist, I would have hesitated in reading a comment to a feminist. <laughs> that, uh, uh, so he says, <laughs> yeah? What he says? Go ahead, finish your sentence, you were about to say something. No, I mean... It depends how a compliment is said. He's not saying that I'm very good at playing the piano just because I'm beautiful. He's saying that I'm a wonderful artist and on top of that, that's okay. <laughs> I can take that and I really thank you. Yeah, no, no, she's very good. Yeah, she's very, she speaks Italian, huh, by the way. She's, All right. you know, these yeah. diplomats. <laughs> and uh, your dad says really a beautiful interview. Thank you very much, Paolo. Conducted with mastery, sympathy, and likeness. Oh, I am so flattered. <laughs> Interested in the content and musical inserts of uh, Miss Stefania, not Mr. Stefania. Congratulations. Uh, Hello, all of you and your admirers from Modena. <laughs> That's so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, uh, Kamal Beer, the violinist, says, Why sab, you must carry on speaking as your knowledge and explanation is so fruitful to musicians. Look forward to listening to Stefani again in your future. Um, okay. That's uh, lovely. Thank you, Stefania. Anything you would like to say to everyone before we conclude? Uh, um, well, the microphone is all yours. Well, it was a big pleasure to be able to talk with you today. And thank you for everyone for staying for so long and listening to all our stories. And uh, it's always a pleasure. And it's... Uh, it's the most important thing for us as an artist to be able to make our voice to be heard. And uh, so it's, it's all thanks to you that you're listening. So thank you for listening. No, no, that's uh, uh, absolutely fantastic. My greetings to you all in London and be safe and be good. And I wish you um, a million more keys than you were otherwise going to touch. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Lots Bye. of love to you guys. Bye-bye. Yes. Love to you. Bye-bye. Uh, I hope your daughter is not going to be furious at me for stealing her mom for as long as we did. She's in school. I'm going to pick her up right now. Actually. Oh, I, oh, I so see. So I'm saved. Timing. So I'm saved. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't. Bye. Then. Okay, bye-bye. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. So friends, it was my conversation with Dr. Stefania Basamonte. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, my conversation with her. Uh, it was extraordinary and I look forward to, in fact, uh, at 9 p.m. I'm to have a conversation with uh, Ustad Saber Khan, the tabla maestro from the Farokhabad uh, school. Uh, he's the head of the school, in fact, uh, joining me from Kolkata, but I have not yet received the confirmation uh, whether they, they had internet issues um, last week, late last week. But I will uh, go live at 9 p.m. Uh, if not, I'll then maybe have to make a change. I'll see. They've not confirmed back to me. But I hope you enjoyed the conversation with me and between me and Stefania. And I'll see you soon. Uh, buonanotte, buonanotte Italia. And a very good yeah. evening to those in England. And Khoda Hafiz, Satkartar Varjika Khalsa Varjik Fateh, Namaskar to everyone else. Thank you all for joining. Really appreciate it. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank well, you so much. Bye. It was you know, very much it was, fun. It was. It was. It was great. It was absolutely brilliant. And uh, I hope uh, it was. Okay.